Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we now resume our council agenda today with a proclamation recognizing Arva Jackson by myself, as well as Council Member Rice and the County Executive. Everybody who's here for that, uh, well, after the presentations, please come forward. All right, well, as the uh, county executive and the president come up, um, just wanted to say that um, so many of us here in this county uh, knew Ms. Jackson, and um, when we reflect on a person who's left us, we oftentimes reflect on our first meetings, our first interactions with them. And I remember I had just gotten elected to the council and I met uh, with Ms. Jackson in the office. She had requested a meeting, and it was my chief of staff, Steve Goldstein, and uh, Arva were in my office. And um, she looks over at me, and she says, you're going to get it because you're going to listen to me. That's how the conversation started. And for all of you who know Arva, you know that's exactly how <laughs> she was. And it was uh, I was kind of taken aback at first. Um, but she reminded me a lot of my mother, um, a person who was always uh, engaged in this because she knew it was the right thing to do, because she cared about her community and wanted to see it change for the better, that she wanted to make sure that she brought out the best in individuals and that you were your best. And so uh, it really is one where when we recognize the number of programs that she's been involved and engaged in and outside organizations like the March of Dimes and others, it's a no-brainer because she cared. And it's so much of something where, you know, we oftentimes take for granted uh, when you say that you care. Um, but when you do, you make tremendous change and have tremendous impacts on our community as a whole. Uh, she was really a master at educating the community about issues that were important uh, and really was that professor <laughs> when it came to uh, making sure that you understood uh, each of the causes that she advocated for. And um, it's really, you know, when you think about the needs of family and children, uh, something that she cared so much about, uh, it truly is something that I certainly tried to follow in her footsteps in terms of as chair of the Education and Culture Committee and a member of the Health and Human Services Committee, it brought those two together. In fact, it's one of the reasons why that continued advocacy landed me on the current commission leading the Early Care and Education Work Group. Uh, and I remember when I did that, she said, you haven't forgotten, have you? And I said, no, what, what are you talking about? And she said, you remember I told you how you're supposed to lead? And she said, you're not supposed to sit there in the room and just let people tell you what to do. You're supposed to go there and tell them what you know. Again, these are words uh, from Ara Jackson that I think symbolize what it is that we need to do as individuals. Continuing to speak out about things that are wrong with our society, to fight against inequities, and to make sure that you're never that person that's silent in the room when you know how much is at stake and how much it matters to all of us. And so throughout her life, She's remained committed to the idea that life is worthy of the best the world has to offer if you're able and willing to work to make sure that people realize it. Well, that was really well said. Um, the first time I met Arva was when we served on the board together for the Collaboration Council for Children, Youth, and Families. And I was the newly appointed director of the Recreation Department. And Arva did for me what she did for so many leaders in Montgomery County. She took me under her wing. And there's a Chinese proverb that says, every step leaves a footprint. Well, her footprints are all across this county because she took more steps to advance social justice and ensuring racial equity than anybody I knew. And she was also a connector in addition to everything that Craig just said. Uh, she hosted what now are termed Jeffersonian lunches and dinners at her home where she would invite leaders from different sectors, public, private, nonprofit, and you didn't know who was going to be invited, but she was always very intentional about who she invited and where she sat them. And I remember vividly 
Uh, she sat me next to our then director of the corrections department here in Montgomery County. Uh, and as the director of the recreation department said, you guys need to talk about the importance of a more definitive interaction between prevention and intervention. And that conversation led, not surprisingly, to a number of programs and initiatives that we were able to enact. But she created the time and place for us to have that conversation. And she did that for so many different people on so many different issues. I commit, uh, as a public official who hopes to be around a little while longer, to continue the legacy that ARVA left. All of us need to commit to continue the legacy that ARVA left. Because even with her last breath, she wanted to make sure that we all never forgot that our most important treasure here in Montgomery County is our children and youth. So uh, to her family, to her friends, to her colleagues, uh, I will never forget her, and I know you never will as well. Thank you. Very well said. Arva was somebody that um, it's kind of hard getting used to the idea that you're not going to see her again. I was used to seeing her and I was used to talking to her. Um, she was always very forthright and she was unapologetic about, about her views on things and unapologetic about her passion for equity in the county. And she was in the first group of people that I actually named as African American living legends in the first group after I got elected in 2019. Um, she played an important role in the community she was truly outspoken. I won't say she was gentle. She was firm. <laughs> and, and she was committed. And I think she understood that being too gentle would also get you dismissed. And she understood she had to be forceful in what she said. She was passionate in her belief in, in care in this community. And she played a, a large role, an outsized role in Montgomery County for many, many years. And, and she's going to be missed. And I think uh, I used to go to lunch with her. We would go to you know some restaurant and sit down. We spent a lot of time talking family, but it always wound up coming back to Montgomery County and why she was engaged and, and what she cared about. So I wanted to be here today to to say a few words um, in her honor because she's like she like I said she's an unforgettable person who played an unforgettable role in this county and uh, she's going to be missed but she leaves a great legacy you know a lot of people can point to the things that we've done and the institutions that got stood up in her time and know that she was a part of all this happening so she will not be forgotten and she like you said she's got footprints and fingerprints on everything and it's a great thing that she's done that so it's very clear Arva Jackson while she may have been smaller in stature was large in life. Um, let's invite uh, all the folks who uh, came today up here while we uh, are, are about to read the proclamation. But I did want to invite, I know that Arlie Wallace, uh, Carol Garvey, a um, couple others wanted to say a brief word. So I want to give you an opportunity to do that as well. Carol, did you want to start off? OK, come on. Arva was a mentor and a role model, an example of how much a person can accomplish as a volunteer. She made a point of getting to know the county council and could quietly, gently advise and educate them as she asked them to be sure that the worthy organizations for which she advocated were adequately supported in the county budget. She was persuasive. She was the driving force in getting a legislative change which enabled the Collaboration Council um, to change from a program within county government to a quasi-governmental organization. And that gave it much greater autonomy, agility, and effectiveness. She spearheaded the development of the African American Health Program and served on its board for years as well as on the boards of many other organizations. I know of no one else who has accomplished so much for county residents, and I'm delighted to see her contributions recognized today. 
I'm Leslie Gray. I'm the president and CEO of the Primary Care Coalition. Um, <clears throat> Arbor really never stopped pushing for, for um, making sure that all children and families had the opportunity to live healthy lives. Um, when PCC was founded in the 1990s, Arva Jackson was already a well-known, well-loved volunteer leader in our community, and she didn't stop in the intervening years. Um, when PCC was founded, um, Arva immediately bonded with the PCC mission and, and became a long-term PCC advocate and board member. When I joined PCC in 2010, Arva was on the board and still very, very active with the PCC. She was notorious for her wit and her wisdom, as people have said, always giving us a, uh, a you know, a, a great learning um, in with a, a wit behind it that was fantastic. She could guide groups through difficult conversations, um, and she would weave in everybody's perspective and insight and bring things to conclusion. Really marvelous at that. She actively championed and strengthened so many nonprofits and programs in this community. As someone else said, she left footprints, fingerprints, everything. It, these programs exist and are strong because of Arva. Thank you, Arva. You know, the foundations that Arva laid here in this county continue on and will continue for decades more. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Arlie Wallace, and I'm the program manager for the county's African American Health Program. I first met Ms. Arva back in the early 2000s. Ms. Arbor had actually contacted me when I worked in another whole role in the state of Maryland. And the one thing that she asked me to do was to actually come and serve and work with the African American Health Program. I had to kindly explain to Ms. Arbor that I could not do that because it would be a conflict because at that point I was actually monitoring programs that the African American Health Program was a recipient of. But years later, in 2015, I actually accepted this position. And it was at that point that Ms. Arbor said, come and see me at my house, baby. <laughs> so I showed up at her house. And she said, here, sit. Here is some cookies and here's some tea. Let us talk. So she immediately took me under her wings. And she expressed the greatest wealth of kindness and compassion to me, being a newbie in county government. But the one thing that Miss Arbor always had on her heart with me, yes, she loved the children, but she was also concerned about the black needs and the black health of Montgomery County. And that is what she wanted to bend in my ear constantly. As she was so involved with not only the older or the chronic disease persons, but the infant mortality that was devastating here in Montgomery County. And once I asked her as she was aging, well, had age, I said, well, Miss Arbor, what about the aging blacks? And she's going to do something. You and Art William can do that. So believe it or not, Mr. Art William and I started working on focusing on aging issues. And that is something that the African American Health Program had not necessarily tailored itself to focus around. So in 2018, Mr. Art William, who, sorry that he could not be here today, uh, he and I started working. We pulled together. And now we have what we call the Aging Subcommittee within the African American Health Program. And we have been trying to tailor and address the issues that has really impacted those blacks who have aged here in Montgomery County. So I wanted to be able to come forth, you know, as the current program manager, to let everyone know that Miss Arbor has truly been a beacon in my life since I first met her. I know she is a beacon within Montgomery County. And as I was telling Wagner, when I walked in and said, Wagner, I've been looking for you for a number of years now. I said she truly indeed loved her children. Uh, so there was not a time that she did not mention Wagner, Janine, and Jeffrey and talked about those grandchildren with me. So I do want to tell you all today, today is indeed a special day that we stand here and I would hope that Miss Arbor will never be forgotten with what she has really left here in Montgomery County and that hopefully we will continue to build in our many sectors that we are actually focused on today and going forward. Thank you. I don't have a lot to say. I just want to thank you all for your attendance and for all those kind and extremely accurate words. <laughs>
Well, amen to that. <laughs> All right, we're going to go ahead and read the proclamation. So, gentlemen, I'll, I'll share that one with you, uh, Mr. County Executive and uh, Mr. Council President. We'll, we'll read this together. Mr. County Executive, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Whereas longtime community advocate and civil rights champion Arva Jackson, who recently passed away, served as co-chair of the Montgomery County Fetal and Infant Mortality Review Board with distinction, Ms. Jackson was a highly valued member of the FIMR Community Action Team and served on numerous other boards and... Whereas Ms. Jackson's wisdom and competence, as well as her tenaciousness and gentle sense of humor, were immediately obvious to all who encountered her. She was instrumental in creating the Montgomery County African American Health Program, which is committed to reducing health disparities and led the African American Health Program's Infant Mortality Coalition and... Whereas Ms. Jackson served on the Montgomery County Commission on Aging and was an early board member of the Montgomery County Collaboration Council for Children, Youth, and Families and... Whereas Ms. Jackson constantly looked for ways to improve the lives of children she joined the board of the Primary Care Coalition and served as a board member for the Center for Adoption, Support, and Education, and... Whereas in 2019, Ms. Jackson received an African American Living Legend Award for her community service and advocacy in shaping African American culture in Montgomery County. Her efforts made Montgomery County a better place to live, and she is greatly missed. Mr. County Executive. Now, therefore, do we, Mark Elwich as county executive, Gabe Albernos as council president, and Craig Rice as council member of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby proclaim November 15th, 2022, as Arva Jackson Recognition Day, and do commend this observance to all our residents. Signed on the 15th day of November in the year 22 by myself, Gabe Albernos, and Craig Rice. All right, thank you so much for that very moving presentation. We now move on to the next item on our agenda, which is item number nine. This is a public hearing on a supplemental appropriation to the FY23 capital budget and an amendment to the FY23 through 28 capital improvements program in the amount of $9,500,000 for bus rapid transit US 29 phase two. A transportation and environment committee work session is tentatively scheduled for uh, November 28th. Persons wishing to submit additional material for the council's consideration should do so before the close of business on November 23rd. We do have speakers for this public hearing and our first speaker is Chuck Reese who is speaking also regarding item number 10 and so he will have four minutes for his testimony and I believe he is testifying virtually and you may begin now. Mr. President, Mr. Reese is not on the Zoom yet. Oh, okay. Uh, then we can move on to uh, Sharon Canavan, um, who is also testifying virtually just on this item alone. So Sharon will have two minutes to testify. Northwood Four Corners Civic Association represents 1,600 households. And FCCA supports appropriations for bus rapid transit on US 29. However, we believe investing in a managed lane is better than installing a dedicated median bus lane. The 2022 study determined managed lanes are both cheaper and faster for traffic. 
when measured against dedicated median bus lanes. Plus, managed lanes benefit carpoolers and all buses, not just the flash bus. By blocking turns at Lorraine Avenue, a median busway will eliminate a northbound access point into north four corners, although adding a left turn to the plan at Timberwood Avenue could preserve an entryway. If Southwood Avenue is the only access, the turn lane and traffic signal time on US 29 should be lengthened, along with more signal time for outbound cars. Also, the dedicated median bus lane widens in four corners from a single lane to a two-lane busway. Reducing available lanes will worsen this choke point right before many drivers move on to the beltway. At a minimum, a traffic study should analyze neighborhood impact and the adjustments suggested by N NFCCA evaluated as part of the engineering phase. Investing $128 million in dedicated median bus lanes won't reduce travel time for autos, including carpools. This big bet presumes up-county suburbanites will abandon cars for public drinks. Managed bus lanes are a better investment of taxpayer dollars and offer the flexibility to measure over time whether public transit adoption increases and then decide if dedicated lanes warrant further investment. Some argue Thrive 2050 enshrines the dedicated median bus lane concept. We simply ask, is Thrive 2050 a straitjacket or is it, as was argued, a vision and framework? Dedicated median bus lanes are costlier but don't improve vehicle drive time. This choice will limit neighborhood access, increase cut through traffic, and add to backups. We urge the council to support appropriations for the managed lane alternative. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will hear from uh, the Director of Transportation, Mr. Christopher Conklin, who will also be speaking to item number 10. Therefore, he will have four minutes for his testimony. Mr. Conklin. Good afternoon. Thank you. I'm Chris Conklin, Director of the Department of Transportation, and I'm here uh, providing testimony on behalf of the County Executive today, requesting you uh, approve the special appropriation for the Phase 2 US-29 Bus Rapid Transit Project. The US-29 flash service started in October 2020, and despite COVID, the reception from the community and riders has been overwhelmingly positive. The County Executive recommended and the Council approved funding to advance pedestrian and bicycle improvements around flash stations is part of the last capital budget and as a result of the US-29 mobility study. Efforts are underway to advance those projects now. The additional study that the County Council requested for a median bus lane option on US-29 has concluded and I am recommending the Council approve a supplemental funding request to advance the median bus lane option to preliminary engineering. The median bus lane gives the flash and other express services a dedicated center lane to avoid traffic congestion and improves travel time and reliability along this corridor that is an equity emphasis area. It has been well established that shorter commute times due to faster public transit are a strong indicator of a person moving out of, posit out of poverty due to increased opportunity for employment. The median bus lane will provide better travel time over the current situation and offer significant time savings over driving, potentially influencing car drivers to use public transit, furthering our climate goals. Advancing the median bus lane from Tech Road to Silver Spring will link the vibrant downtown Silver Spring to White Oak and Burtonsville, advancing the region's access to the East County and allowing East County access to the region as a whole. The median bus lane is also in alignment with the county's transit quarters functional plan, which seeks dedicated bus lanes on US 29. This project would advance transit in a quarter with a high level of usage with only small changes to the footprint of our existing infrastructure. I urge you to approve the executive's funding request. And for my second item today, I am writing on behalf of County Executive Mark Elrich in support of the funding request for the county's capital budget to fund the Farm Women's Park Market Garage and Parks projects. The county owns and maintains and operates over 8,200 parking spaces in the Bethesda parking lot district, including the existing surface parking lots on lots 10 and 24. Over the last two years, and in fact even longer, the county has been working closely with the Parks Department, the Town of Chevy Chase, and private partners to develop this exciting project in downtown Bethesda. The project includes acquisition of an underground parking garage at the Lot 24 site and enables adjacent development, including a small portion of Lot 24. The project will result in approximately three and a half acres of public urban parks consistent with the vision of the Bethesda downtown plan on Lot 24 and Lot 10. Private development will include housing, retail, and rehabilitation expansion of the existing Farm Women's Market 
and surrounding open space connected to the public parks that create an exciting destination east of Wisconsin Avenue. Through a creative partnership, the project represents an investment of nearly $28 million from state, county, parks, town of Chevy Chase, and private sources and public facilities to realize the master plan vision for this portion of Bethesda. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of these special appropriation requests today. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, has Mr. Reese been able to join us? No. Okay. So that uh, is it for our speakers for this public hearing. And so this public hearing is now closed. And Mr. Reese joins us. He's also slated to speak to number 10. So you can join at the end if we have time. So our next item is item number 10. This is a public hearing on an amendment to the FY23 through 28 capital improvements program and special appropriation number 2355 to the county government's FY23 capital budget department of transportation farm women's market parking garage project in the amount of $1,468,000. A Fed and uh, Transportation Environment Committee work session is tentatively scheduled for November 28th. Persons wishing to submit additional material for the Council's consideration should do so before the close of business on November 23rd. We do have speakers for this public hearing, and our first speaker is Mayor Jeffrey Slaveland, uh, representing the Town of Somerset. Uh, Mayor Slaven, you have two minutes to testify. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and for Council Member Friedson's role in getting this funding on the agenda. I am here today in strong support of this expenditure. Our part of the county is vastly under parked, and not only will the residents of my town greatly benefit from this new facility, so will those from Chevy Chase West, Drummond, the village of Friendship Heights, Chevy Chase Village, and our many, many guests from all over the county. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Slavin. Uh, next, we will hear from Mayor Dia Costello, representing the town of Glen Echo, who will also be testifying virtually. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak on behalf of the Farm Women's Market Project. Um, so in Glen Echo, we have values of and the benefit of a lot of parkland. Uh, we have the Claire Barton House, which is a historic house that's soon to be renovated, and of course, the beautiful Glen Echo Park. Um, I know that our residents appreciate the special part of Montgomery County where we live and call home. I think that the residents would be thrilled, even though it's just three miles away, a little under three miles to uh, Bethesda, that they would be thrilled about the renovation of the, the market, expanding the green space. And of course, we all enjoy dining and shopping in Bethesda. So although we're not right in Bethesda, I'm, I know that my residents would be very grateful for this renovation. and. Who doesn't love underground parking these days? Parking is always an issue. And uh, I believe it's supposed to be quite a few hundred cars to be parked underneath. And that would just make the Bethesda shopping and dining and walking around experience even more enjoyable for all of us. So I really heart, wholeheartedly recommend that you fund this. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will hear from McLean Quinn, uh, who will also be speaking to item number 11, and therefore you have four minutes to testify. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is McLean Quinn. I'm the president and CEO of EYA, who is the uh, private development partner alongside Bernstein Management for the Department of Transportation, the Parks Department, and the county in the implementation of this project. Uh, we are incredibly excited to be here in front of you today uh, to talk about it. And I know for uh, Bernstein Management, who's been the owner of the 7121 office building adjacent to this project and part of this project for over 50 years, uh, the idea of having a new uh, park and uh, mixed-use plan here that will benefit the county for and county residents for decades to come is something that we're very excited about. The project that uh, you all have in front of you today is something that is a 
unique opportunity to implement one of the most important parts of the downtown Bethesda uh, plan. Uh, this park will serve as a new destination for downtown Bethesda, and it's only going to be possible because of the work of, of countless numbers of folks. Uh, many of the council members uh, uh, sitting um, behind the table today have had the opportunity to be involved in this project in one capacity or another. Um, and this project has made its way through multiple election cycles, uh, unfortunately now multiple economic cycles and, uh, and a pandemic, um, but we are incredibly excited to be where we are. Um, parks and uh, uh, have proven themselves over the last several years to be a key component of our civic environment. Uh, parks during COVID were a place where people could socialize, where people could come together, uh, and where people could maintain a sense of community uh, when very little else connected us. Uh, Bethesda needs a destination park like the project that this um, funding would make possible. And uh, it's only possible with significant public investment uh, because this is a, a project that will benefit the down county and all of the county for decades and decades to come. Uh, I'd like to just briefly uh, thank everyone who's been involved in the complex project of getting to where we are today, um, but uh, also to reflect on the fact that there have been uh, many, many hours, days, and uh, over the last six years, uh, the challenges that we've had to overcome as a group, uh, whether it's the county executive's office, the county executive himself, the county council members, uh, the DOT parks and park and planning staff and leadership. Uh, the neighbors and the residents of downtown Bethesda, of Chevy Chase, and of the surrounding communities who've been very much engaged in this process, um, to Mayor Barney Rush, who I believe you'll hear from in a minute, who has uh, steadfastly um, advocated for this project, advocated for the downtown plan and the park that was envisioned therein. Um, this project has come together because of careful collaboration and tireless work from countless people. And we're incredibly grateful to be here. So with that said, I look forward to hopefully advancing this project to the next stage, to engaging with the public in the charrette process to design the wonderful parks that we've envisioned here, to move forward with the preliminary plan and the site plan uh, for this exciting project, and uh, to see it built. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will hear from Barney Rush, uh, who is here speaking about item number 11 as well. And so he will have four minutes to testify. There's a button right by the microphone. When the red light's on, you're on. You're on. Okay. President Alpernos and County Council members, thank you very much. <clears throat> on behalf of my colleagues and fellow residents, I speak today in favor of two funding requests which will complete the financial plan for creation of two new urban parks in downtown Bethesda. The development of these parks will accompany the refurbishment of the farm women's market, and collectively, these projects will create an exciting series of amenities for greater Bethesda, enhancing the quality of life for residents, workers, and visitors, and augmenting tax revenue. It will also demonstrate the county's commitment to environmental stewardship, creating one of the largest green roofs in the region. Pavement will be replaced with grass, canopy trees, walkways, and play areas. The vision for these parks arose six years ago during citizen review of the Bethesda downtown plan. Thousands of residents from greater Bethesda came together and signed a petition calling for more urban parks. We agreed that Bethesda could and should support additional density, and it has. But we also believed that this additional density had to be matched by additional open space. We identified the four surface parking lots, two in East Bethesda and the two near the farm women's market, as the most practical means of securing this vision. And our vision is your vision. The need for exactly such additional open space has been highlighted in the Thrive County Master Plan that this council has just approved. Now is the time to turn this vision into reality. The developers, the Bernstein Management Corporation and EYA, have developed an approved sketch plan that is enthusiastically endorsed by the surrounding communities. A new underground garage would replace most of the existing surface parking, and approximately three acres of new urban parkland will be created. The developers are now ready to truly advance this project. 
But the predicate for this project is a credible financial plan. Of the nearly 28 million required, the developers are committing 8 million, most of which is to purchase the density required for one of their new buildings. The state of Maryland is committing $3.5 million, and the town of Chevy Chase is committing $4.5 million. We are pleased to make this contribution to a project outside of our town limits for the greater good of Greater Bethesda. We now ask for the County Council to demonstrate its commitment by providing the remaining funding required. The $2.5 million proposed from the Parks Department funds will come from the Park Impact Payments, which is money from developers in Bethesda and which must be spent on parks in Bethesda. The county is being asked for $9.25 million from general resources, a balanced request representing one-third of the total amount required for these parks. It is a vital amount for this public-private partnership and important that the commitment be made now. I want to close by expressing our thanks to so many who have helped this project to this critical juncture. The developers who have shown tenacity and creativity, the county partners who have worked so long for this project, including the DOT led by Chris Conklin and the Parks Department led by Mike Riley. County Executive Elrich, who has supported this project and backed the communities in their effort to ensure that the parks will be of substantial size. The Planning Board and former Chair Casey Anderson, who put in place the innovative park impact payment mechanism. And the three members of this body, Council Member Friedson, who has been such a staunch champion, and also the two council members who sat as colleagues six years ago, former Council Member Roger Berliner and you, Council Member Bremer. Your leadership led the Council to make the critical change in the language of the Bethesda Downtown Plan that called for the creation of these parks. This change provided the sight lines for our vision. Thank you all. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, has Mr. Reese been able to join us? No. Okay. So that is it for our speakers for this public hearing, and so this public hearing is now closed. Oh, Councilmember Reamer. Thank you. I won't take many words, but I wanted to express my profound appreciation to Mayor Rush and the, the many community leaders who participated in the Bethesda plan process. And <clears throat> this was always, to me, uh, one of the most exciting possible implementations of the Bethesda sector plan. And it was the community vision. It was the parking lots to parks campaign that you initiated and you brought to the council and it was it was an honor to, to support you and to as you said ensure that that language was there and i'm i'm so pleased to be able to support this uh as it is moving forward through the process and i can't wait to be able to spend time in that amazing place that that we're going to all build together so thank you for your leadership much appreciated Thank you, Council Member Reamer. It's an exciting project in a special place. This is going to be great. Uh, we now move on to, um, that closes out our speakers for this public hearing, and so this public hearing is now closed. We now move on to agenda item number 11. This is a public hearing on an amendment to the FY23 through 28 capital improvement program and special appropriation number 23-52, county government's FY23 capital budget for the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, Parks Department, Bethesda Lots, 10-24 parks in the amount of 9,432,000. A Fed and T&E committee work session is scheduled for November 28th. Persons wishing to submit additional material for the council's consideration should do so before the close of business on November 23rd. We had speakers in the previous session regarding this public hearing, and there are no other speakers for this public hearing. And so this public hearing is now closed. Which takes us on to item number 12. This is a public hearing on special appropriation 23-29 to the county government's FY23 operating budget for the Montgomery County Department of Health and Human Services hospital response in the amount of $10 million. Council action is scheduled immediately following this hearing. And there are no speakers for this public hearing, and so this public hearing is now closed. Um, 
we did discuss this in the HHS uh, committee and um, without objection voted unanimously to support this particular measure. We wanted to express our deepest appreciation to our hospitals who have stepped forward in really important ways these last few years especially um, and worked collaboratively. But the practical reality is, is that their expenses um, have gone through the roof since the beginning of the pandemic and they have had to hire um, just as one of many examples that have increased their budgets, contract nurses um, who charge a lot more because of uh, the shortage that we are having. And that, of course, had a profound impact on our hospitals' this budget. And they are critical uh, to our public health infrastructure as a whole. So I appreciate the county executive and his team uh, for working with the hospitals. But most importantly, again, express our deepest appreciation to the hospitals themselves. So with that, Councilmember Rice. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. I unfortunately wasn't able to be at that uh, work session, but did just want to express my appreciation. As many of you know, my mother-in-law works at Holy Cross in Silver Spring, and we have seen uh, over and over again the exhaustion of staff that are in our hospitals. Um, and now uh, that we've transitioned out of exhaustion via COVID, uh, I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of between 70 and 80 percent of pediatric beds are full uh, in the state of Maryland uh, and our hospitals. In the District of Columbia, it's over 90 percent. Um, this is something that is uh, truly ripping apart uh, our hospital system once again. And so it is really important for us to provide uh, the resources to our hospitals, namely in uh, in, in this uh, instance. And so I really just want to uh, thank uh, my colleagues on the HHS committee and the county executive uh, for leading this uh, special appropriation, which I think is uh, not only needed, but uh, certainly going to create a difference in terms of helping them try and get a handle on what is happening right now, because it looks as though with the flu season the way it is, with new COVID variant, um, with uh, RSV, uh, that we are in for a trifecta of our hospitals reaching the exhaustion point. So this money will certainly uh, be uh, well suited for helping our hospitals to balance that uh, tremendous challenge they find themselves in. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rice. Can I get a motion to accept the $10 million appropriation? Moved by Councilmember Rice, seconded by Council Vice President Glass. All those in favor of the appropriation, please keep raise your hands. And that is unanimous among all those present and virtual. That moves us on to the next item on the agenda, which is item number 13. This is a public hearing on a supplemental appropriation 23-22 to the county government's FY23 operating budget, Department of Health and Human Services, in the amount of $3,551,720 for the American Rescue Plan Older Americans Act. Uh, Title III grant as well as an amendment to Resolution 19-1285, Section G, designation of entities for non-competitive contract award status for the Jewish Council for the Aging of Greater Washington Incorporated, Access Hears Incorporated, Arts for the Aging Incorporated, Home Care Partners Incorporated, Housing Initiative Partnership Incorporated, and the Senior Connect of Montgomery County Incorporated. Council action is scheduled immediately following this hearing. There are no speakers for this public hearing, and so this public hearing is now closed. Can I get a motion to accept this special appropriation through a grant? Moved by Council Member Friedson. Second. Seconded by Council Vice President Glass. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor of this appropriation, please raise your hands. And that is unanimous among all those present and virtual which takes us on to item number 14. This is a public hearing on a special appropriation 23-19 to the county government's FY23 operating budget for the Department of Health and Human Services in the amount of $853,699 for the Youth Harm Reduction Initiative. Council action is scheduled immediately following this hearing. There are no speakers for this public hearing, and so this public hearing is now closed. Um, once again, this was also discussed within uh, the Health and Human Services Committee. I want to express our deepest appreciation to all the frontline youth workers who are working tirelessly on behalf of our youth that so desperately need the support right now. Um, so I want to thank the executive branch and all the partner organizations who are doing really terrific work. Can I get a motion to accept this appropriation? 
Moved by Council Member Freitzen, seconded by Council Member Rice. Um, all those in favor, please raise your hands. And that is unanimous also among all those present and virtual. Which takes us on to item number 15. This is a public hearing on Special Appropriation 23-17 to the County Government's FY23 Operating Budget, Department of Health and Human Services, in the amount of $1,593,442 for newcomers enhancements and assistance. There was an amendment that I will get to shortly. Uh, council action is scheduled immediately following this hearing. There are no speakers for this public hearing. And so this public hearing is now closed. Excuse me, Mr. President. Oh, sorry. There are two speakers. There are two speakers, my fault. Oh, yes, my fault. Um, the first speaker is Jerry Crickinson. Apologies. Mr. Uh, Crickinson. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my, my name is Jerry Crickinson. Um, I live at 1701 Ladd Street in, in Wheaton. I'm a member of the Board of Directors okay. and Montgomery County Coordinator for the Congregation Action Network, an association of faith congregations throughout the Washington, D.C. area, working for the welcome and dignity of all immigrants. The Congregation Action Network supports Special Appropriation 2317. Faith organizations in Montgomery County, including several members of the Congregation Action Network, have been providing volunteers, funds, and resources in support of the migrants bused from Texas and Arizona as well as refugees and asylum seekers residing in Montgomery County for years. Our congregations and their members have volunteered for the Respite Center, provided food for migrants temporarily residing in hotels in the county, and provided cold weather and work clothing for migrants choosing to stay in our area. We are happy, indeed blessed, to do so, but the need is great and is straining our resources. We thank the county executive and the council for recognizing the immediate need for more resources with special appropriation 2317 and urge you to pass it today. We also applaud the inclusion of funding for long-term strategic planning. Montgomery County is and will continue to be home to many thousands of immigrants with differing status and needs. The faith community is eager to work with the county in ensuring that all our immigrant neighbors can thrive here so that all of us can thrive here. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will hear from Carla Bustillos, who is here in person. Thank you so Thank much. You. you have two minutes for your testimony. Thank you. Is this on? Good afternoon, Montgomery County Council members. Council President Albornoz, thank you so much for holding this hearing. My name is Carla Bustillos, and I am the director of Vision Diaspora, a regional NGO focused on providing diaspora-based solutions to serve our community in solidarity as they transition to the United States, but also as they transition through the Americas. We attend the migrant crisis from a fraternal um, focus. And um, ever since the migrant crisis, caused the displacement of migrants from the border to our region. Vision Diaspora has been present with the coalition of NGOs and faith-based organizations that provided a first response to this crisis. Um, we also served and provided food, clothing, hygiene products, um, serving their needs so intake to understand the profile of the migrants, but also offering community-based navigators to allow those with medical needs to uh, make it to area hospitals, those with immigration hearings far from our region to make it to ICE offices and navigate that system. And we've been providing ever since um, we've been able to formalize our involvement through MOUs with SAMU, who has been providing an amazing first response and has official funds from the Montgomery County Council. Then we are also working with local faith organizations to provide weekend days of services where we provide legal orientation on what political asylum is and different immigration benefits available, but also that they understand the role that they're under and that migrants understand what their reporting needs are, 
but also at what their responsibilities are, but what their human rights, uh, what human rights are protected and what civil rights will be protected in this area. Um, the appropriation of funds for smaller NGOs that don't have the procurement capacity that other NGOs have would be greatly appreciated. It would allow us to expand um, our services and to have sustainable a sustainable program for community navigators. We have a fraternal, fraternal understanding of the causes for migration, but also the journey, the mental state, and the aspirations that migrants have. And we would truly appreciate it if we could, if that program could be supported. Thank you Thank so you. much, Ms. Bastidas, and we appreciate you and your, your leadership. So there are no more speakers for this public hearing, and so this public hearing is now closed. Um, as I mentioned, this was discussed in our Health and Human Services Committee, and there was an amendment put forward at the suggestion of Councilmember Navarro to add an additional $200,000 for new and emerging organizations um, that have been on the front lines providing extraordinary work um, uniquely to populations of the county um, that need additional levels of help. And we have amazing community-based organizations um, that have been long established, that are doing terrific work in the community, and these funds will continue to support those organizations, but at Councilmember Navarro's suggestion, which the committee agreed was a very good one, um, we wanted to expand that reach. And I'll just mention two final things, that um, as a matter of policy, the last few years, we have, because of the pandemic and all of the uncertainties with the fiscal outlook for the county and the state, um, we did not fund as many new and emerging organizations during that time, but they did this work anyways. And I think it's uh, a responsibility of this council to catch up, particularly in this space, uh, given how challenging the current situation is on the ground and growing every day. Um, and the last thing I'll say is just on a, on a spirit of hopefulness. Um, the way our county has stepped up to provide support for these families is Shouldn't be a surprise, um, but it's still extraordinary. And I'm just so proud of the work of all of these organizations and individuals and proud to live in a community that holds these values so dear. So with that, I'll turn it over to Councilmember Navarro to make some comments as well. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Um, so as I have shared before many times, I am an immigrant who came to this country in a very privileged position and especially through my service on the Board of Education and then on the County Council, became very familiar with the plight of so many immigrants that would arrive here in our county. And we have all uh, learned pretty much the history of a very large proportion of our immigrant population, specifically talking about uh, the 1980s and the Central American Wars and the exodus, if you will, of a lot of our Central American brothers and sisters who ended up here in the um, Washington metropolitan area, but specifically in Montgomery County, uh, we know that there's a very strong uh, community that has contributed greatly to strengthening our county in so many different sectors and so many different areas. Um, one of the things that I never expected as I began to serve on the Montgomery County Council as the first immigrant was that one day, people from my home country, Venezuela, would actually arrive here. At this point, there have been about 7 million Venezuelans who have left that country. Uh, many of them have gone to South American countries, but many have made a, an extraordinary journey through Central America to arrive here in the United States. As we know, the administration has provided temporary protective status, as well as the ability to apply for asylum because of the conditions in the country. And so when this community in particular became a political uh, football where uh, governors of Texas and Florida decided to just ship them to other states uh, and other cities, many of them arrived in Washington, D.C. and soon started making their ways to different counties. And as you said, Mr. President, a lot of these organizations literally rolled up their sleeves and just began to provide services. This was unprecedented. Nobody was expecting this. Uh, and so I want to first thank uh, County Executive Elrich and uh, his administration, uh, as well as this council who has always stepped up. We have done that time and time and time again. 
um, many times um, witnessing a lot of backlash, but we've always done it because this is what makes this county so extraordinary that we don't turn a blind eye to human rights and to human needs. And we are not a body that can work uh, to fix the broken immigration system, but we are a body that understands what humanity looks like. And in this instance, I think that it was the right thing to do to provide these resources to strengthen these organizations, but most specifically also provide a little bit of money, it's not a lot, um, to those faith-based organizations as well as those NGOs who have been working on their own uh, with no funding uh, to provide this very important service. Um, so thank you from the bottom of my heart. On a personal note, as I said, this hits home uh, uh, very directly. And, um, and I'm just really proud and honored that I have had the opportunity to serve on a council that gets it and that steps up in the name of humanity every single time. Thank you. Thank you. Well said, Councilman Navarro. So just colleagues for um, just to round this out, uh, the appropriation is for $1,593,442 plus an additional $200,000 that would be administered by the council, uh, by the county executive's grants or the county's grants program. Um, and so the total appropriation is $1,793,442. Can I get a motion uh, to accept that appropriation? So moved. Uh, moved by Council Member Navarro, seconded by Council Member Jawando. Uh, is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, all those in favor, please raise your hands. And that is unanimous among all those present and virtual. Thank you very much. That moves us on to our final public hearing. Uh, this is a public hearing on Supplemental Appropriation 23-25 to the County Government's FY23 Operating Budget Montgomery County Public Schools in the amount of $2,671,890 for the Supply Chain Assistance Fund. Council action is scheduled immediately following this hearing. There are no speakers for this public hearing, and so this public hearing is now closed. Uh, can I get a motion? Councilmember Rice, please. Yes, uh, and, and, and thank you very much, Mr. President. Before I make the motion, I did just want to acknowledge the reason why this is so important and so many are seeing the rising cost of food across the country in your own grocery stores. Supply chains are being severely affected with our uh, food banks and others, and this is the same thing in our school system. And so this is to make sure that we can balance out some of those costs uh, that are there for our uh, school system. We hope to get to a place where the United States Department of Agriculture will step up and say, that food should be provided for children each and every day that attend our public schools throughout this nation. It is still sad that we as local governments still have to step up uh, and do this when we know this is a core function, uh, something that we know is instrumental to the well-being of our kids, uh, to allow them to focus on school each and every day and not focus on maybe this is the one meal of the day that they're going to have. During COVID, we did the right thing in allowing every single child to have a free meal. That needs to be the case here, but at least this will help to alleviate some of the burdening, uh, the burgeoning costs uh, that are going on uh, with our food and providing that for our school children. So I'd like to move the approval. Moved by Councilmember Rice, is there a second? Seconded by Councilmember Friedson. All those in favor, please raise your hands. And that is unanimous among all those present and virtual. So that closes our public hearings for this afternoon. Uh, just a quick logistical note, after uh, the interview with Dr. Davis, we will take up the resolution to amend council rules of procedure. But I would now like to welcome uh, Dr. Keisha Davis to the dais. And while you are sitting down, Dr. Davis, let me just say, I know I speak on behalf of all of my colleagues that we are very excited to see you. Um, um, I know it has been a long time. And once again, I want to publicly thank Dr. Bridgers, who has worked and uh, done a phenomenal job working in an acting capacity of our public health team. We have not missed a beat under your leadership, Dr. Bridgers, and we appreciate it and will forever appreciate it. Um, and. The role of this position has been elevated in a way that none of us have, could have foreseen prior to the pandemic. Uh, the 
head of public health would come and brief the council twice a year on various matters and it was always a very appropriate and important session um, but obviously with what has transpired these last few years um, people are now focusing on the absolute importance of public health and our public health officers across the country have been under siege um, and have just stood steadfast um, and we I want to thank Dr. Gales for his tremendous leadership at, during the height of the pandemic uh, as things were so disruptive and so disorienting. And Dr. Davis, I just want to thank you. The fact that you were born and raised here in our community is a cherry on top of what is an extraordinarily impressive resume. And your dedication and commitment to public health in our community as a whole is truly extraordinary. So I had the opportunity to meet you uh, many years ago, several years ago, but uh, at the Juneteenth event this past this past summer, and put a bug in your ear then, uh, and I'm so happy that uh, we are at this point, and I just want to thank you again for being here today. So, I will ask a series of questions, and then my colleagues will have the opportunity to ask questions themselves. I'm going to get to you in just a second, Mr. Madalino, uh, just going over the logistics. That's right. Um, and, um, and colleagues, because I'm sure everybody's probably going to want to speak, uh, we are going to institute a five-minute rule uh, to try and get us through, but you can go back in the queue um, if you don't get through all of your five minutes. Um, but with that, Mr. Madalino, I'd like to turn the floor over to you to present this outstanding candidate. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, uh, members of the County Council. Uh, in the time that I've been in and around the county government, I've had the honor to work with Dr. Carol Garvey, with Dr. Elder Tillman with Dr. Travis Gales, and now I'm very excited to bring you Dr. Keisha Davis as our nominee for our local health officer. Um, as you've heard the council president um, uh, speak already, she's a, um, a remarkably talented um, person, a county native, um, a county resident, uh, someone who has a distinguished career in public safety and public service, in the private sector, in private practice. Um, she brings the type of resume that I think the community um, was expecting in our local health officer. Uh, I wanna add my thanks to Dr. Bridgers, um, to uh, Mr. O'Donnell, um, to Dr. Um, Kroll, uh, for everyone who, who stepped up to um, replace Dr. Gales um, and to so ably serve this community. And you're right, we didn't lose a beat. But um, we are going to, uh, the beats are about to pick up, I think, with Dr. Davis joining um, our, our administration and the county government. And I think you, as the local board of health, will be extremely ably served to have her as a partner in making the important decisions about public health, um, health in all matters, in dealing with health equity. Um, so I am thrilled that we are able to recruit um, someone as talented as Dr. Davis for this position. I greatly appreciate all of the patience you showed as we went through this search and your willingness to um, think about a different approach to this office. Um, and so I'm very excited that Dr. Bridgers is gonna continue on as our division chief in public health. Obviously, some of you will have his nomination um, during, the next, um, during the next council. I wish we could move even quicker on that, but um, we are fortunate that we are going to have two extremely talented, committed people leading this community in public health. And hopefully we won't have to make the decisions we've made over the last few years. But if we do, we will be in very good hands with, with Dr. Davis um, and Dr. Bridgers and the rest of the public health team. So thank you very much, um, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Madalino. And I'd be remiss, I know he's tuning in virtually uh, to acknowledge and thank Dr. Kroll as well. Um, his leadership throughout the pandemic. But before that, as a division chief, focusing on mental health issues here in Montgomery County, uh, his public service has been exemplary mm -hmm. and we've very much appreciated his leadership. So with that, Dr. Davis, I'm gonna ask you a series of questions and then again, we'll turn it over to my colleagues. Colleagues, just text me to let me know um, that you'd like to be in the queue. So the first question is, please describe your experience, background and education as they relate to the position of Montgomery County Health Officer. 
So thank you, Council President. I'll just start by appreciation for you and the Council for me being here. That June 18th event was an event that I had not planned to go to, and I had a conversation that I had not planned to have. Um, and sometimes fate works out that way. And so this really, for me, is a coming full circle um, to, to serve this way in the county. I am a family physician and a community health advocate. My roots for my family go back to the Civil War, um, to slavery. I was born and raised in Montgomery County, and I'm a proud Quince Orchard High School graduate. Um, after my family medicine residency, I joined a community health center with, deep, with a deep commitment to the LGBTQ plus community, serving a largely Latinx population in, uh, and the hidden poor in one of the nation's third richest counties. And while there, several events coincided. My ever lengthening list of patients with diabetes, my master's in public health, which was opening my eyes to many of those upstream drivers of health and the passage of the Affordable Care Act, which pushed me to really envision a better health care system. And the confluence of these events really helped me to realize that my patients' problems were becoming bigger than my prescription pad. And that motivated me to really understand how to better advocate for all of my patients. A White House fellowship followed, where I worked at the intersection of the food and safety and health safety net and gained insight into the governmental levers to improve our broken system. After the fellowship, I helped open a primary care practice right here in Gaithersburg focused on whole person health and sought to ensure that all patients walking through our doors had excellent care regardless of whether they called me their PCP. For me, a, health, uh, a medical practice should en enrich and improve the lives of the patients that, that sit around it and the community that is a part of regardless of whether those patients walk through its doors. And today is the Vice President of Health Equity at Allidade. I work every day to ensure that our nearly 1.7 million patients have high quality equitable care. My experiences as, as a White House Fellow, as the Vice Chair of the Medicaid and CHIP Payment and Access Commission, as a member of the Board of Directors for the American Academy of Family Physicians, give me deep insights into the governmental and community levers needed to impact health. They are all your patients. Those words echo as my mantra and my guide for all I do as a family physician. I remember being an intern, that's your first year of residency, looking at the board of 13 patients on the wall, me feeling relieved that I only had five or six of them to round on, and I mentioned that to my chief, and he scolded me saying, they are all your patients. And that was both a call uh, to action and an eye-opening alignment of the relationships and responsibilities of being a physician. This has become my true north, and as a family physician and county health officer, Montgomery County residents are all my patients. I am driven to impact health both inside and outside the exam room, working to ensure that everyone has a trusted primary care clinician to help quarterback and guide their care. But I also recognize that so much of what drives health occurs outside of the exam room. And in this role, I seek to really impact the community, societal, and governmental levers that drive healthy outcomes for all our residents. Thank you so much. Second question is, please describe your understanding of the health officer's role and the position's relationship with the council, which in Montgomery County also uh, we sit as the Board of Health. Yeah, so I want to start by commending the Board of Health uh, for the job that they did in COVID. Um, Montgomery County was one of the first cases of COVID in Maryland, and from that moment, we led. Um, in our response to COVID, we lead and continue to lead in the rate of vaccinations uh, with a low death rate, and that was because of the collaboration of this council, the uh, Board of Health, serving as the Board of Health, working together collaboratively with Dr. Gales and also Dr. Uh, Dr. Bridgers and Dr. Crowell, and that really took putting aside political agendas and egos and sometimes entrenched processes that got in the way and weren't helping. And so. Really, Montgomery County has been a leader in that, and so I want to commend the council in doing that work. And I hope that that spirit can continue. You know, at its core, this, uh, this role holds accountability for protecting the health of the public and ensuring that the residents of Montgomery County receive their essential health services. But it also means working to ensure health equity, that everyone has the best chance for obtaining their best health. That means envisioning health and well-being as more than just access to a clinician, but optimizing the social drivers of health that can have an even greater impact on a person's health and well-being. And so I encourage the board to continue to take that health in all policies approach and consider the health impact of all new legislation. 
To me, that means working with the county council, especially as the Board of Health, on providing accurate and transparent uh, data on the health of the community and recommendations based on the best available information at the time. We do recognize that the data changes over time. Um, and so a, a recognition of being transparent and providing the des best data that's available then and when that changes, providing those updates. At my core, I'm a collaborator um, and look forward to working with the Council and Board of Health on meeting the health needs of Montgomery County. Thank you so much. Great answer. Uh, next question is, how do you envision your role in addressing issues of racial equity and social justice? In particular, what strategies would you implement to reduce disparities in health outcomes? So as the Vice President of Health Equity at Allidade, I've spent the last several years working on exactly these issues. And first, there needs to be a recognition of the role that racism and social justice play uh, on our health. And I was proud to see that this council um, endorsed and recognized in declaring racism as a public health issue. Um, that has race and the experience of racism in and of itself as a social, social driver of health. And we need to move beyond studying the problem um, to really implementing those solutions. And that means targeted outreach to communities and uh, with disparate health outcomes, inviting them to be a part of the solution. Can't just solve it for folks. Really need to leverage community partners such as the Latino Health Initiative, the African American Health Program, the Black Physicians Healthcare Network, and the Asian American Health Initiative as partners in this work. The areas of focus may be different for each of these communities, which disparity might, might arise, uh, but partnering with those organizations, community-based organizations, hospitals, healthcare practices is essential as they all have a role to play in reducing health disparities. An example of this that might sit outside of what you might typically think of as public health, I think of um, public safety as an area for collaboration. So I collaborated on a paper with the American Academy of Family Physicians on community policing standards. And one might initially wonder why are family physicians weighing in on policing standards? But when you understand the role that police interaction has on one's long-term mental and physical health, then it makes perfect sense. Our communities reflect our health. And so thinking about health in all policies, it's not just the exam room, it's education, it's transportation, it's housing, it's policing standards. And so while intentionally working to identify and mitigate existing disparities is necessary, it is not enough. We must continue to ensure that we are building systems that do not perpetuate the systemic racial and uh, class-based inequities that we see. That means improving education, housing, access to care, and addressing other health-related social needs. Health in all policies means considering equity in those policies as well. Thank you. A couple more questions. What strategies do you find successful in reaching diverse populations and people for whom English is not their first language? Do you need me to repeat that? Please. OK. <laughs> um, I have, I what strategies? <laughs> Uh, what strategies do you find successful in reaching diverse populations and people for whom English is not their first language? Yeah, so muchas gracias por la pregunta. <laughs> Connecting with folks in their native tongue always helps, but I don't speak all languages. Um, and so I really work hard to connect with people on a personal level, regardless of where they are from. And, and you know, to this regard, I would especially like to recognize Council President Alvernaz and Council Member Navarro for their work that they have done for Por Nuestro, de, uh, Por Nuestro Salud y Bienestar. It is an ex excellent example of a public-private partnership that has had tremendous success in reaching the Latinx community. I know that Dr. Will Jawando and Craig Rice have also uh, been working on similar initiatives in the African-American community. And these are the types of initiatives and programs that we need to really continue. They are targeted and working with these communities to solve their problems rather than trying to swoop in and solve problems for them. Making sure that materials are available in multiple languages and having translators present, that's the bare minimum of things that we need to be doing. But really it's about meeting people where they are, being willing to go to them, approaching people with cultural humility and the assumption that they know what's best about their community, really engaging them as partners in the work identifying those community leaders and approaching communities with an, with an attitude of cultural humility. You don't have to be from a specific community to connect with that community 
or to be an advocate for the people within it. But when you approach folks with an attitude of mutual respect and accountability, you get far, you get much farther. Amen. <laughs> All right. Um, as the county continues to emerge from the pandemic and grapple with its ongoing impacts, the vision for the county health officer is to lead public health efforts in Montgomery County across agencies, departments, disciplines, and the wide range of factors that impact public health and health outcomes for residents. Please discuss how you will implement this cross-cutting and multi multidisciplinary approach to public health. So just starting by saying with, I, I approach it with transparency and openness. Um, and you know, building on the strong work that uh, HHS has already put in place, and I, you know, I'm proud to say when folks ask me about you know why I want to do this, um, I think that there are some folks who come to government positions, uh, who, especially when they are coming from the outside, from uh, the private sector, who are coming in to fix it. And I am not coming in to fix it. I am coming to work on a team that is well established and working well. Um, and I bring that level of transparency and openness. I think it's probably time to reassess the state of health in Montgomery County in a post-COVID era. Uh, we did some of that work uh, pre-COVID. There was a state of the health of the county, but COVID has changed things. And so looking at where we need to, um, you know, where those disparities exist and where we need to focus. Really looking to identify community partners. I look forward to working with our nonprofit organizations, our hospitals, our medical offices and health centers. Um, and Montgomery County Public Schools to really advance health in this county. In this position, I serve a lot of bosses. You, the County Council, Board of Health, the County Executive, Director of HHS, the state. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm ultimately responsible and accountable for the health of the people of Montgomery County. And I am accountable as a physician, as a community resident, as a mom who will be out on the soccer field and their, and my, kids, teammates, parents are gonna come ask me questions. And so really um, recognizing the, the importance of, of that in this community. Again, they are all my patients. As a trusted physician, collaborating, collaborating with government officials to ensure that we are building and rebuilding this community in a way that optimizes health and reduces disparity. We will not always agree, but that is my North Star. Man, smiling. Um, last question is, are there any potential conflicts of interest of which we should be aware? That's easy, no. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Davis. All right, colleagues, um, I've got Councilmember Jawan. I should mention that my husband works for MCPS. Okay, well, that well, that's an asset. So. <laughs> I think so. Yes, all right. Um, so, uh, colleagues, we've got Councilmember Jawando, followed by Councilmember Rice, then Councilmember Friedson, then Council Vice President Glass, then Councilmember Katz, and then Councilmember Navarro. Uh, Councilmember Jawando. Thank you very much. I'm check my clock here. Okay, five minutes uh, or less. Good to see you, Dr. Davis. Uh, thank you for your commitment to public health, to our community. Thank you for your family's commitment. Um, you know, I have to take a point of personal privilege. I know both sides of your family, have worked with them for years. Uh, your brother and I worked in the White House together down the hall from each other, and when he had hair, we people used to confuse us. Um, when did he have hair? <laughs> <laughs> um, and your dad and I have marched in protests together, and just your, your, your husband is an amazing uh, part of what MCPS is trying to do to make sure all kids have equitable education, and that comes from your parents and your long lineage here. So just so excited uh, that you're here. Thank you. The only thing I'm sad about is that you're, all your patients, you know, that in your practice, they're going to become your patients in another way because you have that, they're all your patients, but I'm hoping we're going to refer them out in our, our great black physicians network in some, in some way because they are, that's a, that's the only loss I see here. I, everything else is a gain. Um, you mentioned a couple of things I just wanted to ask. You said something that I just really appreciated. Uh, mitigation is not enough, but we must build systems that address kind of the underlying causes. I'm paraphrasing what you said. Um, you know, one of the things that the pandemic showed us that we already knew, it just blew a hole wide open in the disparities that we had. You know, whether it was trying to get people a vaccine, trying to get people tested, uh, all those things that all getting people masks, you know, transportation, vaccination site, everything that we tried to do, it showed us another set of disparities. Um, talk to me about 
how you what do you see as you know your should you be confirmed when you're confirmed approaching those systems in a systematic way like how do, what what's your priority list how do you think we uh if you want to tackle those what do you think we need to do in addition to the work that we've done to tackle them in a systematic way that i think all of us want to do so you know i think what the county has already done, and I can hear it in the talk, is creating that baseline level of understanding equity um, and creating that training and education that needs to happen across the board. And once you've done that, then you can really start to target where the disparities are. And I think you need to really approach it with a level of why. And so if we're looking at, for example, um, health disparities in the Africa, uh, uh, heart disease disparities in the African American community, you need to dig into why is that disparity there? Why? why in this community is there an access issue are they not able to get to the hospital in a in, in an appropriate amount of time is it a food issue it is a trans is it a housing is it an education issue and that question might be different for different communities and so it's really thinking about where are where is that biggest disparity that we're trying to tackle and how can we focus in on that area with the level of why and another why and another why I appreciate that, and I hope you'll, and I know Dr. Bridgers and Dr. Kroll and uh, Dr. Gales before you, we've talked about, we want to hear from you all about what you need to get to those whys and address those whys. Um, in the budget, policy-wise, as the Board of Health, I know the county executive and this will want to hear, and the state will want to hear. We've had some issues with the state uh, that I think that are going to change, and I think we're, it's a unique time in history to address disparities at the root cause. Uh, and not just treat the symptoms. So I'm, I'm so glad to hear your health and all policies approach and your acknowledgement of this council's work, a resolution I introduced with colleagues to declare racism a public health crisis. Uh, there were some things in there that we said we were going to hold ourselves accountable to that we need to double back on and, and look forward to working with you on that. Uh, there's a growing body of research um, around telomeres and the shortening and the weakening of cells uh, because of institutional and structural racism that actually makes you more susceptible to disease uh, and, and lower your quality of life, something that is just emerging that, that I think we need to, to be a part of and, and, and dig into. So I look forward to working with you on all those things. I'm going to come in 30 seconds under budget and just say you have my vote uh, and just so excited to work with you and he's shocked <laughs> thank you shocked I'm shocked that he came in 30 seconds under I, well, I, I will re take this moment of personal privilege I think we have met on a few White House Easter egg roll lawns so I we have appreciate we that. have we have there was a whole brief hiatus there for good reason but. yeah mm -hmm. I love those connections uh, so once again colleagues I've got Councilmember Rice followed by Councilmember Friedson then Council Vice President Glass then Councilmember Katz and Councilmember Navarro Councilmember Rice well, thank you very much, Mr. Council President and Dr. Davis. I don't know if you watched the morning session, but the young lady sitting to my right is not Council Member Navarro. This is our Council Member for a day, our student, uh, Council Member Wandi. And, um, you know, um, one of the things that uh, she's very passionate about is about affordable housing. So I do have one that talk to me a little bit about what your views are, because, you know, typically we, we stick to the same things, you know, addressing um, hypertension, all those kinds of things, and say, well, that then is led to by diet and all those kinds of things. We don't talk about more of the other things that actually surround a person's health and environmental health when you're talking about the environment that you live in. I'm not talking about the environment outside. Where you live has a huge impact in terms of what it is that we look at for health outcomes and disparities, primarily for people of color and lower socioeconomic status. Talk to me a little bit about that and what you'd like to see happen here in Montgomery County for those who are experiencing some of those challenges. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, the impact of housing and all of the social determinants of health are really important, right? As a physician, when I'm trying to um, prescribe insulin per se to my patient and they don't have a refrigerator to keep that cold in because they don't have a safe place to go or they're going to be moving housing from their you know, car to their mother's house, to their best friend's house, right? That that gets in the way of me being able to successfully treat their diabetes. When a patient is stressed about their ability to pay rent, stay in their house, that's going to affect their diabetes, their blood pressure, all of those um, health things that I, I can't fix in my exam room. And so I really need 
the council to be thinking about how do we create systems so that people have safe, affordable housing? How do we, you know, it even comes to the point of thinking about where people live and work do we have opportunities for people to work in the county to also live in the county so they're not commuting for you know hours and hours and sitting on 495 raising their blood pressure shouting at the person in front of them and so how we think about um, building an environment that is conducive for health whether that be housing transportation but all of it, I think it's a recognition that all of those things also impact our health beyond just whether somebody can afford their medications or not and thank you for that. And so now my, my other question, when I attended the White House uh, uh, conference on hunger, health, and nutrition, um, there was a common theme that was there about prevention uh, and also about food being medicine. Uh, talk to me a little bit about what you'd like to see here in this county when it comes to the availability of fresh produce and all, all these conversations around food as medicine and actually prescribing fresh fruits and vegetables for a lot of our impacted communities that already exhibit health uh, disparities and what it is that you'd like to see this county do more of. And I'll just kind of vary the lead a little bit. I know that Jose Andres had recommended as a part of this conference that we have food improvement districts uh, throughout this country. Just like we have business improvement districts, why not have food improvement districts? So just wanted to get your thoughts on that. That'll be my last question. Sure. You know, while I, when I was a White House fellow at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, I really got to work on a lot of these issues and looking at um, how food, how we use food for health. And I think there was a mindset in the past that just give people food and it'll be okay. And we are moving to the recognition of it needs to just be more than food. We depend too much on processed food. How do we get people fresh, healthy food? And there were a lot of programs changes in the SNAP benefit to allow for more healthy uh, healthy foods, expansion at farmers markets to be able to use SNAP benefits at that place, being able to use WIC benefits um, to really encourage the use, the um, eating healthy foods. When I was at Chi Healthcare in Gaithersburg, uh, food as medicine was a core tenant of our practice. And so we actually had Physician's Kitchen where we would bring people in and teach them how to eat on a budget. Our nutritionists would go shop, how do you feed a family of four for under $10 in a way that tastes good and that my kids will eat. And so let's bring you in, show you how to eat, uh, show you how to do it on a budget. And I think when you think about the long-term ripple effects for that, right? So, uh, you know, if I can teach a mom how to, eat and help her kids eat well, you know, yes, that helps solve, not solve, but helps treat her hypertension today, but that also makes her more available for her kids, more available for her community. Her kids are learning from her how to eat in that way. And so the ripple effects of thinking about food beyond just um, calories in bellies, but really the importance of nutrition is so important. And I think thinking about that collaboration um, is a big part of what I hope to do. Well, Dr. Davis, it's clear from your answers here that you are very well prepared uh, to enter this hitting the ground running in terms of the things that we need to do right here and now and into the very near future in terms of addressing the healthcare needs of our community across the board. The reality is, is that there's so many of us in this county that are fortunate in being able to have the access to affordable uh, to health care that is affordable for us as individuals. Uh, but it also is high quality. And the reality is, is that that does not exist for so many people in our community. Thank you for what you did in helping to address that in your previous role. And I look forward to seeing what the great things you are in your next role. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Friedson. Well, thank you and, and welcome. Uh, I know we're all excited to, to be here at this moment, uh, to have you in this role and to have this role filled, which is so important. Uh, to the county that it's not mentioned here that your most important criteria and qualification is a leadership montgomery classmate uh, so i just wanted to to note that i'm not sure what relevance that has to public health uh, in the county but i'm sure somewhere somehow leslie is uh, uh, back there telling us uh, that, that that it might but um uh, appreciate it and thank you and, and i just wanted to note you some of your family members are here and it was noted earlier by colleagues but i couldn't think of a, uh, a, a a person and also a family that has been more committed to the county with deeper roots uh, in the county than you have and that your family has. So 
I really appreciate that. I think it's really important as part of this uh, conversation. So thank you for that. I also want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Bridgers and all the work that, that he has done. I know this will be a really good partnership. And thank Dr. Kroll, who I know is, is, is listening in for, uh, for his uh, service as well. I know this is going to be a moment of transition for, for public health in the county and, and for uh, HHS. And, and you're going to be a key part in helping us drive that uh, direction, which I, I'm looking forward to. I uh, just wanted to ask, um, up to this point, this job in its prior iteration had been thought about as an advisory job to the Board of Health and as a job focused on DHHS, almost exclusively, if not exclusively. And now the new vision that we're hearing, which I'm supportive of, is, is a broader view to have the other role split out and really working on the day-to-day -day operations of the health department and within DHHS and having your role and your function really thinking more across the enterprise, across county government, across uh, the, the county. Uh, and that is both really important and also somewhat daunting, I would think, uh, in terms of uh, how many things relate to public health. I mean, you, we can't talk about an issue uh, here, uh, whether it's transportation, whether it's housing, uh, whether it's food, that doesn't have a direct nexus to uh, public health. And so I'm just curious, you're coming from a background of really focusing on developing strategies and visions and tactical plans uh, of how to specifically address the social determinants of health. You know, how are you going to approach that? How do you come up with that plan? You know, what are your, you know, wh how are you going to prioritize that uh, given how broad this new role and mandate uh, seems to be? Yeah, well, the first is not trying to eat the whole elephant at one time, right? And so really um, understanding where the needs are and where to start, you can be, it's easy to be overwhelmed by all of the social drivers of health and how they come into play. And so it's really focusing where is the need the greatest um, and starting there. So looking at where those health disparities are, where are the communities that might be being left behind. If you take, you know, COVID for example, um, and you're, if you're thinking about the vaccine rollout, where are the things that we need? Is it that we need to get people to the sites? Not as much. People seemed we did a really good job of taking the vaccine to where people were. Maybe it's more of an education literacy piece to help bring people on board. Maybe it's more of a um, education to help people to understand the importance. So I think a lot of it is um, rather than saying we are going to solve all social drivers in one stroke of the pen, I wish it were that easy but really trying to be targeted and specific um, in where we start, and then having a vision to get that incremental change along the way as well. Appreciate that. I'd love to work with you and work with this body as you move into this role to figure out what those metrics are of how we judge you know, what we're doing and, and how well we're, we're doing. I know you need some time to figure out what those uh, would look like, but I think that would be really helpful and really important for us all to work together to make sure that we're driving funding and you know, resources and priority areas in the places where they're needed uh, the most. And then the other question uh, is related to MCPS. And obviously, you have direct connection uh, there. You'll, you go home to it every day, uh, which is great. Uh, but you know, MCPS is also elevating the, uh, the role of you know, a similar role in MCPS, which is really uh, important and moving forward with that. Just wondering how you see the dynamic of working collaboratively uh, in your role and in that uh, new role at MCPS and how you see that relationship working. Yeah, I think I'm really excited that Montgomery County has this role now. I'm excited to work with Dr. Kapunin um, in her role. I think there's certainly opportunity for collaboration. There's no shortage of health needs. Uh, so I don't think that there's um, a concern or worry that there won't be enough to do. Um, and I think there's a lot that we can do to partner, especially around the mental health of kids. I think as we're coming out of the pandemic and seeing the effects of, you know, of that on our kids and being out of school, really how we can partner and thinking, you know, specifically in the role that she has to play with kids in the school system, but also with me thinking more broadly on how the county really kind of structures that support that wraps around um, the school system. So I think it's a huge, exciting opportunity um, to work together. And I'd like to joke, because I'm back there, that I get to sleep with the school system every day. So um, <laughs> we're, uh, you know, excited to be able to In the to context of public these. health, I'm not going uh, to not touch going that to issue. Right? I'll just point that out. But I, I appreciate it. I think it's going to be really important for us to better understand, you know, wh what that collaboration looks like and how this relationship 
works and who's responsible for what and how the coordination works. Obviously, there's a lot of intimate relationships between MCPS and county government and HHS, even during the, the, the school day, um, and, 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 and obviously beyond, because the health of anybody doesn't stop when a bell rings. And it doesn't start when a bell rings. It's 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 a continuity issue. So look forward to working with on the metrics, working on that, and just really excited that you're uh, here and your willingness to serve the the county and really appreciate it. So thank you. I think we get to serve leadership Montgomery proud. Yeah, I appreciate that. Good. I'm class of 2008, uh, Council Vice President Glass. Uh, thank you, Dr. Davis. It's good to see you. Um, and you know, I had received uh, an email from somebody. Um, who wanted to express their support for you, and it was a patient of yours. And if you'll indulge me, I just want to read that email or part of it. Uh, it. The person wrote, I was fortunate to have Dr. Davis as my primary physician at the former Casey Health Institute. I have only the highest praise for Dr. Davis and her approach to meeting the medical needs of the community. And so uh, glowing, glowing review. Uh, and, and I uh, appreciate the um, unsolicited support, um, but clearly you're hearing it from, from all of us and you have it from me. Um, one of the things I, I appreciated about your comments was you talked about the mutual respect that is really needed. And unfortunately, one of the reasons we've had a hard time filling this position is because of the lack of respect. The vitriol, the hatred that some people in our community have expressed to us, but we're elected officials. We have thick skin, but unfortunately, it is some of our public servants who step up bringing your expertise, your knowledge, your passion. And you, and a predecessor, namely, was on the receiving end. Um, and Dr. Travis Gales, who had this position, faced homophobic remarks, racist remarks, um, and it was absolutely terrible. And in this moment of candor, mm -hmm. how do you feel about stepping up to help keep the residents of Montgomery County healthy and safe? Yeah, I, I appreciate the question. And again, appreciate Dr. Gales for what he did and for what he went through. Um, and it was not an easy time for him and many of our other public health uh, officials across the, com across the country. I have friends who are in this field um, in other states as well and experience just a level of vitriol and hate for something that they in many ways you know volunteered for that was just unacceptable and i think you know COVID in a lot of ways in some ways it brought out the best and how we work together but in a lot of ways it brought out the worst as well um, i don't think that there's ever a way that you can truly prepare yourself for that level of attack um, and I, I i know for a fact that dr gales didn't expect that going into the role nor do I expect that going into the role. I think I hope that we are, you know, getting back to a level of civility and, and normalcy in that regard. Um, but I hold public service in high regard. And I recognize that in doing that, that also requires growing a thicker skin. Um, and that there will always be somebody that disagrees with you. Um, and, and that's okay. And I think understanding, you know, my role is to bring the truth, bring transparency, bring the data, and that's what's gonna rule at the end of the day. And there are some who are gonna disagree with that. And I think if we can understand where you are coming from, where I am coming from, that allows us to agree to disagree. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I think you know this is a conversation that had to be had. Uh, and if there's a prescription that can be given for, for creating a tougher skin, I'm sure we'd all like to take it. Uh, but, but I want you to know that earlier this year, uh, we passed a resolution here at the council, the one that I introduced, that called for our support for public health officers, recognizing the vitriol, the hatred, uh, the unkind comments that have been hurled at these positions, not only here, but nationally. And we unanimously passed that resolution. And the other way to say that is we have your back. We will continue having your back so long as we all continue doing right for this community, trying to keep everybody healthy and safe, learning the lessons of the pandemic to move forward in an equitable manner where everybody has access to health care and all of the secondary and tertiary needs to fulfill that. And so I look forward to working with you and thank you for stepping up. Amen. Thank you for that.
Thank you. And yes, we will. Uh, I've got Councilmember Katz followed by Councilmember Navarro, then Councilmember Reamer, and then uh, Councilmember for a day one day. Uh, Councilmember Katz. Thank you, Mr. President. And let me say as I begin, uh, I want to publicly thank, uh, as everyone else has, I guess, Dr. Bridges for his continued service and publicly thank Dr. Kroll and 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 Dr. Uh, Gales and and uh, and as we go down the list, we don't want to forget any of our public health officers. They've all served us so very, very well. Dr. Garvey, Dr. Kilman. You know, I uh, really don't have a question of you, Keisha. I, I um, want to say publicly that we want to all thank you and your family for everything that, they, that you continue to do. I remember, and I think you might remember this too, I was at the 150th anniversary for Goshen United Methodist Church and the Dr. Davises were there, mm -hmm. and and somebody came over to me and said, "Did you hear the rumor that that you might be considering at that point, considering uh, doing this?" And I thought, "Well, I'm going to go over and try my best to convince her." <laughs> and I know Everett was there with me about two seconds later at my, and and I said, "You know, if you'll do that, we we obviously you were the person for this, and I, and Dr. Gales did a wonderful job, and it's been pointed out." several times that he did a wonderful job during a time when people were much more uh, nasty to somebody who was trying to save their life than ever should have been. I mean, he was attempting to save lives and people didn't appreciate it. And, and for all the, the ridiculousness that he had to go through. But it, it is such an important job and, and it is so very necessary. And those who are are working to make certain that the public is safe, um, really appreciate it. It's the people that look at the negative, that you made me wear a mask. You made me, we didn't, we didn't do something because we felt that it was the nice thing to do. We did something because we thought it was the right thing to do. And, and that becomes a very difficult thing. But let me, let me just say, I've been honored uh, to vote for many a nominee that the county executive sent. I voted for Rich Manolino. I've been honored to, twice. I, well, all right, I was honored one. No, no, no. Was, uh, I've been honored to vote for many a nominee that the county executive has sent over. And I, and I mean this sincerely, but I've never been more honored than today. You and your family have been absolutely committed to our community and, and, um, you know, my colleagues have heard me say many more times than they've ever cared to hear me say that I sincerely believe a community is a family, and I'm very proud to have you in my family. Thank you very much for doing this job. Well, thank you, Councilmember Katz. You have been a friend to the Green Davis family for many, many years. You were at the uh, 150th anniversary of the Pleasant View site. You were at the yes. opening for Casey Health Institute. Yeah. You have been, um, you will forever be our council mayor. So you'll always be the, the mayor for the city of Gaithersburg. So thank you for all that you have done for uh, for many of the things that we have participated thank in. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm turning it back before I turn to tears. Go ahead. Oh. And Councilman Katz, you don't have to preface that. We love it when you say it. I okay. All right. I'm, okay. I'm going to remind you true. said that. It's true. It's true. <laughs> All right, uh, I've got Councilmember Navarro followed by Councilmember Reamer and then Councilmember for a day one day. Councilmember Navarro. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, well, I have to say that I know we've been looking forward to this moment for a long time. Uh, and as I sat here listening to the responses from you, Dr. Davis, I can clearly say that the wait was really well worth it because you absolutely, in my opinion, uh, touched upon so many of the areas that I personally believe uh, we need to address at this particular moment in time. And as it has been mentioned before, you know, Dr. Gales, Dr. Bridgers, Dr. Kroll, they all have done extraordinary work. And the pandemic, I think, came to teach us so many things. Uh, but now it's like the really tough job of figuring out what is the next phase. Um, and so first, I also want to say that I appreciate the notion of this particular position, how it has been sort of re-envisioned, um, because I think that meets the moment. Uh, and also, I really appreciated your response to how do we connect with communities. And it was literally, like, I think last week that my deputy chief of staff and I were talking, and she used that term of cultural humility, which I like so much more than cultural proficiency. Um, and to me, 
I think that's what really, you know, drove um, the work that we did heal here collectively regarding for Nuestra Salud Bienestar and the African American Health Program, and we saw the results, right? And and I think that to me was just such a powerful example of how it is that when we have cultural uh, humility, that we do get that response from the communities that oftentimes people love to to um, to refer to as as hard to reach, right? They're not hard to reach. It's just that we haven't really done it in the most culturally, you know, uh, humble fashion uh, that we should. So I, I guess, again, I don't necessarily have a question. I really am so pleased with uh, your, your vision um, and your experience. It's obvious that because you are a uh, person who has long-standing roots in Montgomery County, you understand very clearly how complex our county is and you definitely have what it takes uh, through your service, uh, your professional service to address those issues. So I am thrilled that I get to uh, vote for you and I look forward to see how you will continue to expand this notion of cultural humility as it relates to all of these different uh, aspects of public health, of which by the way, Montgomery County has invested uh, quite a bit in establishing an infrastructure. So we have a lot of assets. Uh, what we need is somebody to come here and just really, truly connect all those dots going forward. So uh, thank you so much for applying to this job and your willingness to serve in this capacity. Thank you, Councilmember Navarro. And thank you again for the work again with Proyecto. Um, Bien, uh, salud, bienestar. Salud, yeah, salud mm -hmm. bienestar is really important. I mean, it really, I do think, is a model for um, what we can do um, in communities of color to really create those partnerships for health. Thank you so much. I've got Councilmember Reamer next. Well, thank you very much for being willing to step into this position, which has been uh, a tough position to hold and um, you know I'm, I think it takes some courage to be willing to do it and we're grateful for that and I hope indeed that we're in for a much calmer and uh, more supportive environment in the coming years and um, and uh, we'll we'll certainly hope for that um, I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about mental health and some of the kinds of thoughts that you are currently having about how the county could tackle that. You know, it feels to me as though the, the weight of the pandemic that really mental health is a bigger and bigger share of the impact now, especially here in a community like ours where people are overwhelmingly vaccinated and um, you know, we ought to be we ought to be putting more of an emphasis there. So um, if you could talk a little bit about how you see this position relating to that challenge and any preliminary thoughts you have about what what we could be doing. It, you know, I've had the benefit in all of the um, primary care practice settings that I've worked in of having a mental health professional there. And so seeing that inter, uh, interaction and interplay <clears throat> between physical health and mental health and how important it is and how they can really feed off and collaborate um, with each other to the benefit of patients. And so when you think about building that network up in the county, there's certainly a workforce issue around mental health. We just don't have enough mental health providers. I have friends with kids um, who need a mental health provider who are on wait lists for months waiting um, to be able to see somebody. And so how we uh, start to get creative with opportunities to using things like telehealth and other resources to be able to meet some of that mental health need that exists. Also, how we leverage the school system, thinking about wellness centers, what can we do within the school day and working together uh, with, the, with the public school system to think about what are some of those tools that we can implement within the school system for mental health for the, for the kids. I think a group that often gets left behind in that are the parents. Mm -hmm. um, and so are there ways to leverage 
um, the school system and other wraparound community programs who are dealing with the mental health of their kids and work and COVID and navigating all of that. And so how we think about, you know, what are those programs that need to be put in place? I think mental health probably needs to look different than it does today. This reliance on you're going to find a counselor or, you know, therapist who's going to be with you one on one, go to their office, you know, once a week, that doesn't work for a lot of folks who, um, who have jobs. And so, again, thinking about telehealth, other opportunities, group visits. Um, but also, I think it gets back to building a culture of support um, and helping to move some of the shame that comes with mental health diagnoses. And so how do we create communities, um, businesses that give time to, to allow people to take those mental health breaks that they need for their well-being? And again, that comes back and influences the health as well. Thank you. Council member for a day one day. Hello, Ms. Davis. It's really nice to meet you. My name is Malika. Um, I'm kind of going to circle back around. You kind of brought me right into my um, question. Um, so we know that Montgomery County is very diverse, and you have mentioned that our communities reflect our health. Um, and so I know that we're working on affordability and awareness. Um, but my question for you is how can we start on inclusion? And what I mean by that is that there are a lot of cultures and you mentioned that you do love to connect with people on a personal level and you do love to make people feel supported. And I know that you already have a lot on your plate to begin with, but I wanted to ask, how do you plan to make sure that every community feels, or every community is aware or is supported whether it's in schools or jobs or community service areas, um, yeah, community centers. So yeah, that's, that's my question. Thank you, it's a great question. I would turn it back around to you, but I, will, I won't right now. You know, but I think, I think it's important to, to um, understand that diversity does not equal inclusion. And so we have a very diverse county, but that does not necessarily mean that we have an inclusive county. And so, you know, when you're thinking about inclusion, you know, diversity is, you know, seeing different folks at the table, but inclusion is really, do they feel like they belong? Do they have a path to um, voice their opinions? Do they have a way to be heard? Do they have um, opportunities for advancement? And so, you know, diversity is just the beginning of the path towards inclusion. And so that, again, I think it comes to meeting people where they are, seeing that representation, um, having that connection to their council members, and you don't necessarily, again, have to be from that community to be able to represent the voice of that community, but you do need to make an attempt to understand the cultures that you are representing and how you um, show up for cultural events, for community events, how you make people, um, help people feel that you are representing and, and understanding their views is really important. And so again, it's not just looking at the numbers on the page, it's really how do you make sure that you're showing up in support. Thank you for answering my question. I know you had also mentioned um, having translators as well for those, but yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, great questions, colleagues, great comments. Dr. Davis, thank you so much for being here today. We really look forward to working with you. Um, in this capacity, and as Council Vice President Glass mentioned, we will have your back um, in more ways than one. Uh, we look forward to innovating together to address some of those disparities that have been around for too long. Uh, and I know that you are primed and ready to go. And we want to just, again, express our deepest appreciation for your willingness to serve. So with that, colleagues. Can I Mr. President, oh, sorry, so, Mr. Madalino. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President and um, Council Members. Um, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with the sentiment that I think Council Member Navarro said the wait was worth it with Dr. Davis. Um, uh, I want to express my appreciation on behalf of the County Executive for your willingness to take up a range of nominations. I know um, while you've been trying to get to the end of the term, we've sent over a bunch of people, but um, all of them I think have been um, extremely um, strong candidates. We greatly appreciate the time you have taken to go through um, all of them. Uh, you know, today has been a bit of an ego, um, you know, deflating moment for me as, you know, Council Member President, you said, um, uh, 
the OHR director was the most important person in county government. <laughs> and <laughs> Councilmember Katz said he's more proud of a vote right. for Dr. Davis than the right. vote for me. So, so talking about mental health, I'll, 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 I'll try to deal with that. Councilmember Glass didn't even mention we were in leadership Montgomery together. So I don't know. So, but I did want to, um, putting aside that for a second, because I don't know if I will be with you on November 29th. So I wanted to make sure that I take this opportunity to thank Councilmember Rice, Councilmember Hucker, Councilmember Navarro, Councilmember Reamer for your distinguished service um, for the for the people of the county on behalf of the executive branch, on behalf of the thousands of county employees who you've had a chance to affect their lives. I want to make sure you hear a thank you from all of us for your service. On an individual basis, it was very interesting listening to the questions about inclusion. When I started with this county government in 1995 as a gay person, I was closeted and afraid. In 2022, I'm the chief administrative officer. I've gone from being avant-garde to just another dull white guy who was working for the county government. So, um, and that journey is progress. Thank you extremely. It is great. It is great progress. And that's why I wanted to thank you and especially the four of you who are departing because I know I had the honor to serve with Councilmember Rice and Hucker and in Annapolis, I've had the chance to work with Councilmember Navarro and Reamer on so many different issues. We changed the world in Maryland when the US Senate is about to pass marriage equality, I think this week. Um, the whole reason why this was put on the national stage was the actions we took in Maryland as the first state to adopt it at the polling place because our polls closed one hour before Maine um, on that day 10 years ago. And then the Supreme Court case, which of course has its roots in, in Maryland. So I didn't want to um, let this moment um, go by without recognizing and thanking you for the service that you've done for so many people in our community, our county government, our residents, and um, your service was well worth it. You've left an incredible mark on the community, and it's been an honor to work with you and serve you with you in a variety of capacities. I look forward to working with the other council members um, during the next few years as um, we continue to build upon the strengths. I, hopefully, you are all leaving this term recognizing that this is a very strong county government. From the highest reaches to the county government to the entry level, we have, I thought, brought in a distinguished group of people who will continue to lead this organization very well and continue to deliver the best services for our residents. I hope you are proud of everything you've accomplished over the last four years. It's been an honor to serve with you during those four years. Mm, well said, Mr. Medellino. Thank you for saying that. Thank you. And I know my colleagues appreciate it. Um, well, we have two uh, actions to take now, colleagues, uh, which are motion hand votes. Uh, first, I'd like to request a motion to accept the nomination of Dr. Keisha Davis as our county health officer. So moved by Councilmember Rice, seconded by Council Vice President Glass. All those in favor, please raise your hands. Keep them up so we can take some pictures. And that is unanimous among all those present and virtual. Congratulations, Dr. Davis. Mr. President, just, just, just wanted to note that you actually got 10 votes because you have council member for a day. So you're actually better than all the other folks who've been appointed, just, just so you know. That's right. I love it. That's one more vote than Rich Battle. That's right. That's right. That's right. All right, and now, colleagues, uh, could I get a motion to accept the nomination of Ms. Tracy Anderson as the Director of the Office of Human Resources? Moved by Councilmember Jawando, seconded by Councilmember Navarro. Um, all those in favor, please raise your hands. Everybody look at Robin. And that is unanimous. All right, congratulations to both of you. All right, so colleagues, we will now go back to an item from this morning that we deferred to the afternoon, and that is the resolution to amend the council rules of procedure. Okay, so I'll at a high level tee this up um, and then turn it over to the team uh, to go into the specifics. But um, needless to say, with the transition from nine to 11 council members, uh, there had to be some changes in the rules of procedure um, and appreciate the effort of central staff to walk us through some of those changes. 
Uh, my colleagues and I have also had the opportunity to reflect on the last four years and make some recommended changes that we believe will put the next council and future councils in an even better position to succeed. So um, I want to now turn it over to uh, Ms. McCartney Green and Ms. Sokoni uh, to walk us through the packet. Thank you very much, Council President. Uh, good afternoon, and good afternoon to the whole council, including our council member for the day. Congratulations. <laughs> Uh, my colleague, Ms. McCartney Green, and I are here to present the amendments to the Council Rules of Procedure. Uh, you'll recall these were introduced on October 25th, and the public hearing was held on November 1st. Uh, what is before you today is a packet for a work session and action, and um, our, our proposed format, and we'll, we'll take, you know, we'll take a cue from the Council President. We, were, we would have to have a vote on each uh, amendment, so we can, we have a memo, we can run through each amendment very briefly, but maybe the vote could happen as we go. I think that'd be a good idea. Okay. And I think colleague, as we've done, colleagues, as we've done in the past, rather than a motion for each one, if anybody has an issue, let me know. Um, but if not, then we'll do without objection. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'll, I'll uh, just, I also just want to mention. But actually, Councilman Jawander, did you want to speak now since we're going to go through these? Okay. Got it. Okay. Okay. And so if, we, if there's an amendment with regard to a specific item, we can, that can be presented at that time. I do want to point out that the, the staff uh, memo that you have before you has some numbers, but those numbers don't necessarily correspond to the rule because not all the rules are being amended. So item one in the memo is not necessarily, it turns out item one is for rule one, but some of the item numbers in the memo not necessarily correspond to the rules. I'll go straight into it. Uh, the, the first item is, um, uh, it will be at circle two, and this is just adjusting the numbers to correspond, to match what the charter says now when you have 11 members. Uh, majority will be six, and two-thirds will be seven. I think without objection. Next item is uh, uh, item two in the memo. is really addresses uh, the rule that's at circle six, and uh, this is just to modernize the rules of procedure, the rules of procedure have not been amended in quite some time, so they predate the time when virtual meetings were prevalent. And this is just to uh, make it clear that uh, even though the default is personal attendance, there is an option for council members to attend virtually. Uh, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. If their personal attendance is not uh, possible because it's unreasonable or it's impractical, they can make a request to the council president. Uh, we're, we're proposing that there be a separate uh, procedure laid out outside of the rules for how you consider these requests. Okay, we do have two comments on this one. First, Councilmember Jawanda, then Councilmember Friedson. Thank you. I uh, appreciate all staff's work on this. I know we, uh, it's a lot going on at the end of the council term, so thank you for doing this. Um, you know, one of the things I think we saw today, and we've seen a lot since the pandemic, is that technology has been kind of a silver lining of the pandemic, um, in that we've included so many more people, and. You know, I know per, I personally didn't know what Zoom was prior to the pandemic. I think I probably wasn't alone. Um, and it's opened up the amount of dialogue and testimony that we received, but also the ability of executive staff agencies to present and experts from other parts of the country to participate in committee hearings and a whole bunch of things. So it's been a, a positive. Um, and I, I think that uh, similarly, especially a body our size, it's 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 enabled uh, council members. Uh, you know, we were virtual for a long time, all of us, but it's enabled council members to, as evidenced by today, for various reasons, or to participate remotely. Um, and I think it's good that we're updating this uh, to explicitly say that presence is participating uh, in a virtual manner. Um, we talked about the attendance issue, um, and while I think that uh, the uh, default should be attendance at council sessions in person. Uh, I do think this clause around uh, impractical or unreasonable makes sense. Uh, I, I have concern around the next sentence, though. Uh, we talked about this and that the, the determination of impractical or unreasonable rests with the council president. I think we are a body of co-equal members and uh, that if we need to police ourselves, we will. Uh, but I don't, I don't think that that uh, case-by-case case determination should be left to one person 
it could, you know, I don't think it would be, but it has the potential to not uh, be used appropriately. I just think we, this is a some, not an issue for us and that it should be uh, expectation that you're in present, but that you don't have to seek approval for whatever reason, which is how I read this. So um, but because of that, I'm gonna move that we strike uh, everything after unreasonable, a decision about whether a council member's physical presence at a meeting is considered impractical or unreasonable will be in the president's discretion and made on a case-by-case -case basis. Second. Okay, we have a motion and second. Um, we now have a discussion and I've got uh, Council Member Friedson followed by Council Vice President Glass. I'll, if Council Vice President Glass wants to speak to this motion, I can yield. I, I was gonna bring up a separate, separate issue that is not noted here, but has, I believe, been previously discussed related to committee sessions and the chairing of committee sessions. So I'll, I'll hold back on that for the moment and, and I would just like to go back into the queue if that would be okay. No problem. Councilor Vice President Glass, did you want to speak to this specifically? Sure. Okay. Uh, so, so I'm just looking at the text right now and so it is uh, section two and then which letter is it? C. C. C and then everything after unreasonable. unreasonable. Uh, okay, so I, I appreciate the spirit in which the motion was made. Um, I disagree with it. Uh, quite frankly, I think that we are public servants here to work for the people of Montgomery County. And the expectation is that we show up as often as we can. And as it notes in this policy, there are stated reasons that are, I think, the average constituent would understand as reasonable. And that's really all this says. And as we enter a new council, a majority of whom are new, I think we should set the expectation that council members show up. And if there is one of the delineated reasons as to why they can't, well, those reasons are here. And so I don't see a problem with the policy as it's outlined. We are here to do the work of the people and we should be here in the council chamber as often as we can. Thank you. I've got uh, council member Reamer followed by council member Navarro and then council member Rice. Thank you. Could you explain a bit the distinction between the, what I think may be a statutory or this, these are rules of procedure, but uh, the part that's underlined and then the policy approach seg section because uh, the policy approach section is quite clear to me <clears throat> and I'm unclear how it relates to the previous section. Okay. So the the rule itself is rule 5B, right? And uh, we're proposing that that states, you know, attendance is, is expected. If you're not able to attend and your attendance is impractical and reasonable, the council president would make a decision. Now, the reason we're suggesting a policy approach with re it's it's the policy would be outside of the rules. To sorry, make, sorry. I need you to slow down a little bit. So, you referred me to five B. Okay, so correct. Uh, I should uh, but in the in not. the packet that I'm looking on, I'm on at the proposed amendments. Okay, so uh, I see something circle labeled six. C. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. So I see it, but it's described as amendments to Rule Five B. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Page, okay, page three, the, yes. Like the the amendment is at page three of the memo. Okay, got it. See in the back. Oh, yeah, look. Yeah. We got one of these in my This is outdated, uh, but it's been a while. So. It's been a while. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. So, Rule 5B, would it be amended? Um, it might be easier to find it. The circle number would be circle six. Okay. In, in your packet. And, um, okay. So, circle page six attendance and then sure? so the policy stuff is just not written there we, we we're proposing to not include the policy stuff in the rules yeah, right. just because the you know a policy should, it should be something you have it's flexible enough that you can change it from time to time without having to formally change the rules but are the I mean I, I, I agree with removing this language about the council president having to approve I 
don't love that, but is the intent of the rule, and I, I believe the, 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 the motion consistent with the subsequent policy language that's mm -hmm. written. Um, so the expectation is that the policy language that's provided on this page is what we're uh, really agreeing to as, no. as sort of the ethos of in attendance? Mm -hmm. So uh, what you would be voting on is really, if you look at page three of the memo, attendance, the only language you're voting on is the underlined language. Right. The but policy stuff will not be in the rules. The new that would be established with the new council. You've provided this as guidance for us as we're thinking about it. And you don't see those two as in conflict? Uh, no. OK. Um, uh, so the reason for suggesting that there subsequently be a policy, which you can come back to at a later date, is if you give the president, the council president, the power to make these decisions, what factors should the president consider? So it might be a good idea to at some point adopt a policy, not necessarily now, but we're proposing a policy that might look something like this, where you, you spell out what are the considerations that are appropriate for the president to take into account in making that decision about whether your request is reasonable or whether attendance is practical or not. And what is the reason for requiring the, for having the council president uh, make that determination? What's the, is staff, there a parliamentary uh, base, you know? So st the staff proposal is purely based on, you know, we, we, we were thinking of something that's um, uh, easy, something that's uh, uh, logistically practical. Uh, you know, in a case, would you really want the whole body to convene and decide whether, you know, uh, uh, for instance, I'll just give an example. The, the request may be based on a medical reason. And, and is that something you want to discuss in a public forum and take a vote? Or do you want to just designate an individual who makes that decision? But it's, that's not law. That's, it's a policy decision about whether you're comfortable having a central person make that decision. It was purely, we, we were proposing it for practicality. Uh, it's it's a policy decision. You could you could actually vote to to remove it, and that's perfectly within your prerogative. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and apologies, Councilman Navarro. I should have turned to her directly after she made her second um, in the motion. But Councilman Navarro, thank you, Mr. President. I wanted to explain why I seconded it. I think that the mere fact that we are able to participate virtually as exhibited by the fact that I'm participating virtually because I didn't want to risk uh, possibly affecting everybody. <laughs> um, I think that actually has added to the ability of council members to participate in deliberations. I mean, in the past, this would not have been possible. So I think that in, if anything, the virtual uh, world that we had to sort of migrate into has provided additional opportunities for both constituents as it was stated, staff members, council members to participate, um, when in the past it just would not have been even a possibility. And so I see this as an additional thing, uh, a plus, if you will, for our constituents to actually be able to trust that their elected officials can have you know, a continuation of, of service and continue with the business of the council uh, even if they have to participate virtually. Um, I also believe that council members, you know, we, we stand up to run for office. Our constituents, our voters, they vote for us. And the understanding is that they're trusting that we are adults, that we take our oath of service very seriously and that we would never abuse it. Uh, and if anybody ever does, well, you know, guess what? Uh, they will be probably facing some consequences at the ballot box. So this additional language about the council president having to literally give permission to me just seems over the top. Um, I appreciate the examples that have been given. I think those are very, um, the very appropriate. And as a matter of courtesy, what we all have always done is to reach out to the council president and say, hey, this is happening or this happened, et cetera. I won't be you know, present or I'll have to join virtually for these reasons. Thank you so much. And then there is an understanding. So this is why I decided to second it because I felt like it went a little bit, a little bit too far. I mean, we are adults, we're professionals, we're elected officials. And uh, if we don't take our service, um, you know, seriously and we abuse it, I think there will be consequences 
uh, that will occur. Um, so, so I just, you know, I wanted to explain that that was that was the reason and why um, I don't I don't think that there should ever be a circumstance where account the council has to, you know, would have to come together to vote to you know, whether something constituted a reason for a council member to be virtual. But doesn't I feel like we're just going into some strange territory there. Um, so anyway, um, you know, as I said. Um, Having served in this body for 13 and a half years in the past, we just, you know, as a courtesy, would let our president know, staff director know um, that we could or could not be here. And I think that we should continue to do that. And if ever there is abuse, I think that then the voters would definitely have to address that. Um, or there should be a conversation, obviously, um, regarding uh, any kind of abuse, but I, don't, I haven't seen that happen. So if anything, I think this technology has helped us participate even more um and, and i see that as a plus thank you thank you i have definitely some thoughts on this but i'm gonna uh, wait till after councilmember rice and councilmember freitzen speak so councilmember rice is next well thank you very much mr president um you know it's kind of hard for me weighing in as a person who's about to leave the council on what telling you guys what you should do so that let me just preface by saying that but um i kind of have to agree with the simple fact of even just putting it, um, and I'll take it from a different perspective. It's not necessarily about uh, giving power to the president to make a decision, but having the burden of making a decision like that is not something that I, uh, having served as president, would want to have to do, to have to be in that position to determine whether or not someone I felt, based on these things here, these categories, uh, or these potential policy reasons, would be something that I think as another person who's elected by the people just like everyone else. And just because I got elected by my colleagues to be president doesn't mean that then I can say, oh, you're in violation of such and such because your rule doesn't adhere to what my thoughts of the rule are. That's just a lot to ask for a person and you could run into potential conflicts that way. So this isn't about the justification of the president being able to make the decision from my perspective. This is about you creating other kinds of internal problems uh, between uh, council members that I think would be an issue. And at the end of the day, we're all council members. The title of, and no uh, offense, Mr. President, but I've served. So, um, you know, us being elected by president is not what sits on uh, you know, our uh, identification, it is council member. And so from that standpoint, it really is something where I'm just concerned about you setting up something that's going to create problems down the road if there is a problem. I would just say that the, the, the whole piece about the attendance, um, you know, look, in, in my 12 years on the council, there have been some people who've been more absent than others, but it hasn't been something that's been something chronic. I have been, you know, uh, over the years that I've been in office, it was a thing uh, with my chief of staff that, you know, I'm there all the time for uh, committees as well as um, for council sessions. Uh, and it was a big deal um, because you being seen and you being present uh, is something that's important to your voters because they look at you and they say, I want you there to make sure that you're representing me. Um, but that being said, you know, over the past couple of years, uh, with COVID and everything else and with my national travel, I've actually seen to where it's been easier for me to be able to do those things that still actually advance uh, the role of my constituents, my role with NACO and what I've been able to do and accomplish while still actually being virtually in attendance. I mean, I can tell you, NACO folks joke about it all the time. They're like, yeah, Craig's in council session right now, so don't walk over and talk to him. I mean, my chief of staff, Sharon, knows it all too well. She's been there and seen it. Uh, and we make a, a big deal about it. And so from that standpoint, I don't know if it's a bad thing. I actually think it's a good thing for us because you actually have people doing double duty. Not only now do you have you just attending here, you have folks attending other things that are also beneficial to the county at the same time as they're doing their duty on in, in serving on the council. And so from that standpoint, I just think it's a lot to try and, you know, try and address it from that standpoint and say, okay, we're going to create these hard and fast rules about this. When you haven't seen it, um, that's gotten to a point where it's something that's an issue. I do think that if in fact you do, it's always something that you could take up at the time. But I think right now, uh, based on where things are, I'd avoid it just based on the potential conflict that you could have from an internal structure. So that's just more my advice uh, than it is anything else. Thank you, Councilmember Rice. Councilmember Friedson appreciate it. I am uh, 
I understand where everybody is coming from on this, but I do appreciate what is being proposed here by council staff, and I, uh, you know, agree with what Council Vice President Glass was saying at at, at the outset. Uh, and I just will note, if we are using this as a rule and a procedure, if we have an expectation that we're setting and no mechanism to actually enforce the expectation, then it's neither a rule nor a procedure. It is merely a standard of conduct that we're suggesting. And if that's the approach that the body wants to take, I, I, that's fine. But you know, the purpose of the document here is to set rules and procedures for how we're going to operate. And if the rule and procedure here is that you attend in person, and if you don't attend in person, there are certain standards that we expect in order to function as a body, and we lay them out, and then we provide some level of flexibility, then I think we need to do that. You know, I, I understand the concern about the president's sole discretion here, and we do operate in, in general to say that the president's powers are only as strong as the majority will of the body. I mean, it's a weak president structure with all due respect to the very powerful and mighty current council president and all those who uh, came before him. But from a, from a functionary standpoint, you know, the, the, the presiding officer and the committee chairs in our body are only as strong as the will uh, of the majority. So, uh, you know, I, I would personally think that if we are going to say that you're, ex, you know, expected to attend in person, we have certain standards of what that means and some mechanism to, you know, determine what is and isn't appropriate. I, I would be fine if it was based on the will of the majority, you know, that the council president would still be in you know, would, would have to be, you know, we, we, we appoint the council president in order to, to, to help facilitate and determine that. Uh, but, you know, I think ultimately, uh, if we set an expectation in a rules and procedure, then we ought to have a mechanism to actually ensure that we're following the rules and the procedure or else we're just setting a very broad standard of conduct, which is different from what I thought that the intention of the document is. Thank you. I've got Councilmember Katz, and then I'll, I'll make my comments. Councilmember Katz. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I, I actually am supportive of this. I, I believe we're adults, and um, we should um, make certain that we are treated as adults. I, I, I can understand that no one wants anyone to be uh, uh, in any way to, to, uh, to, to not attend a meeting. And if you're not a, if you're not able to be physically in the room, there was a time just a couple of years ago that you you couldn't attend the meeting. I mean, the the there, there was no virtual uh, uh, way to do these things. We can do it now. And if I mean, if the if a, a the council president has enough to do without having to worry about last minute or whatever. If somebody decides that that they're, you know, ha, had a, 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 a something that they uh, were going to do and they felt that they should uh, just do something virtual. It, at this point, I believe we should uh, allow people to attend virtually and say you're expected to be there. But if you're if you want to attend virtually, that's better than not attending at all. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks. So appreciate everybody's thoughts and comments. Um, my council presidentship ends in 21 days and nine hours. And uh, <laughs> so uh, it's like that scene in Forrest Gump when Forrest, after he travels back and forth, he turns back to the audience and says, I'm, I'm pretty tired. Uh, that's, that's how I have felt, especially these last few months. Um, and as I've told folks, I've learned quite acutely the council presidentship is not a ceremonial position. Um, but I appreciate and respect everybody's uh, perspective on this. There's no question that we're in a better place now as a society because we have more options to be able to come together um, in person or virtually than we had before. And for obvious legitimate reasons such as sickness or if we have to attend a conference on behalf of the body but want to be able to perform both functions, you know, there are very reasonable um, 
reasons for, for having to tune in virtually, but still be able to participate. But I think we've all agreed collectively that we also want to make sure we, we, we set an expectation that if somebody's not going to be here in person, um, it's for one of those reasons and not, not a different reason. Um, we, we all signed up for these jobs because these are our jobs. Uh, we, we, we were in all competitive races. There are a lot of people that want to be able to do what we're doing. Um, and I think we have a responsibility to the public and to each other because I think we benefit um, when we are more in person than when we are apart. And the conversations that sometimes happen in the hallway, um, especially among our staffs, uh, are, are, are really beneficial. And just taking two steps back, you know, this is new territory, not just for this council, but for the entire country. I mean, every industry, public, private, or nonprofit, is having the exact same conversation about determining what the procedures should be for attendance, whether it be virtual or in person, in every office setting. Ours happens to be a little unique because of some of the circumstances, um, but this is not new. So I, it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but I can't think of another practical way to provide the council with a tool to be able to, within reason, enforce a policy that there doesn't seem to be disagreement on uh, in the first place. Just the, the spirit of it's better to be in person if you can be than not. So that's why I, I will not support this motion, but understand and respect where it's coming from. Um, and we can revisit this. If, if it's not working, um, we can revisit this midway through. And we also, you know, <laughs> the, the, the process of wanting to join leadership is somewhat competitive as well. And so uh, as we engage within our colleagues on those votes, um, you know, requesting, you know, positions for leadership, uh, I, I think that's sort of an organic check and balance to make sure that on the council president's side, um, that there isn't there there is an abuse on that side either. So uh, it's a close call for me, but but I I do support um, the way it's written as currently stated. So we've got a, a somebody else want to speak? Right, we, I could, yeah, I at the end, but I can wait till it's on. Okay. I just have one comment or question. Sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. Council Member Friedson. Yeah, I guess my question would be if we strike it, and it seems that the will of the body seem, seems to be there, which I respect. We, we function on majority rules here. Um, I'm just curious, should we include or are we expecting that we will have a policy on this? Because, you know, I, I just, you know, I, I get the concern about the sole discretion of the council president here and whether that creates unfortunate circumstances that people want to avoid, and I understand that. But we need to have some standard that this is adhered to. May request the option to participate. There's no one to request from. You know, like, are you requesting, if you're not requesting to the body at large, and you're not requesting to the council president, then there is no request. So it, it, I just, I just would, I would hope that we could clarify that, even saying pursuant to a policy as established at the beginning of the year or something you know, s something to that effect, and then, and then we can come up with this exact policy for how it is determined. Then maybe the, the four items that are very clear of what they are don't need a vote, and then the unforeseen circumstance that is something that is subject to a vote, or that's something that the council president provides. So I just a clarifying question to the motioner and to staff, if appropriate, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah, I appreciate that. Mr. Please, the all-powerful yeah. president. Yeah, yeah, not so much. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I appreciate the, 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 the all the my colleagues chiming in. Um, I'll I'll address these out of order. The May request I interpreted that we could always have tighter language, but I request I I call equin, <laughs> you know, or in in in. So, I, request I deemed like technical request, like I need the ability or Miss Rupp or you know, the, the clerk to request that I need you to have us be online. That's how I interpreted that. We could tighten it up. So I actually don't think you need to change it if it's interpreted that way. Um, just as a kind of a technical part, you, you need to obviously notify people that you need to do this in a reasonable time. The notice, we talked no, talk notice in the, uh, 
meeting as well. Um, and I just want to back up, and Councilmember Navarro said this as well, and so did Councilmember Katz and several people in Councilmember Rice. This is a, a benefit. This is a positive thing. Um, and I think the, the voters benefit from having their council members be able to participate. Uh, the example that Councilmember Rice stated about being at NACO, under this policy that's mentioned here, is not, wouldn't, isn't covered. Um, it's not an unforeseen. He knew he, he, knew he was going to NACO. To NACO. Uh, it's not an inclement weather, it's not death, it's not illness, it's not medical emergency. So under, you know, not, and I know this was just illustrative I, from staff and we're not voting on it, but it's just an example of a perfectly, perfectly reasonable thing uh, that uh, isn't allowed under this draft policy. Uh, I, I think that the expectation is set. You know, we have an expectation that council members are kind to each other and that they don't yell at each other or treat people badly. There's no, you know, if that became a problem, we would need to set a policy about how to handle that and have discipline and enforcement. There are a lot of things that we expect of each other as elected officials that we don't have an official policy on or an enforcement mechanism. Now, I think we should have a expectation as is laid out here that we're attending in person, um, but you can request to participate virt virtually, again, which is a good thing not, you know, because you're still out allowed to do what voters have asked you to do. Um, and if it became an abuse, in, like any other thing, if it was abused or not used properly, the body would could address that. But I, I don't think we're in that situation where all adults has been said. Um, and I, so I don't think we need uh, to speak to this. As far as the separate policy approach, I would have the same concern. We can certainly, I am certainly comfortable to Councilman Friedson's point of the new council will have views on this, you know, and we can, I think it's 90 days, is it in 60 or 90 days that you can change the policies? It's, it's one in of those 90 days. 90. Just, they can be changed. It's just the a difference by majority vote versus correct. super You're right, majority enough, vote. You can change them anytime. You can always like, change them. They're easy just, to change in the first. It's a majority time. rules right, right. in the, yeah. So I'm sure there'll be views. I know there are views on this and other things contained in here. Um, so I would just, uh, if, if we, at a future date, the future council wants to look at this again, but I don't think that uh, we need it. I think we should govern ourselves. We're all adults. This is a positive thing for the county. Um, and uh, so I would just ask that I keep my motion as is. Okay, uh, Council Vice President Glass. Uh, thank you. So I'm maybe I'm not as good as uh, counting as some others. I heard three, and I'm not quite sure where the others are. But I, uh, let me let me say this: if if the motion carries. Um, and I'm not sure if procedurally now is the time to say this, but um, I, I understand the concerns, and I still think that some of the concerns people have uh, are, are unfounded given the policy approach delineates five different reasons why someone would have an excused absence is what we're really talking about. And they're all, you know, medical illness, uh, death, weather, or things beyond the council member's control, which I would think includes conferences and uh, and other council-related activity. So I'm not quite sure what else falls out of that bound that there's concern about. Uh, but what I would like to say, uh, and I'll throw this out here whether now is the right procedural time, uh, but when there are, uh, when we have individuals who are virtual, as is noted in the, the counts, uh, virtual and present, um, I, I think the minutes should reflect who's in person and who is virtual. So that, again, the full transparency for our constituents are, are aware. Um, and so I throw that out there for consideration, if not now, at another point in time. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. I think that more information, the better. There's a lot of things I think we should tell our constituents that we're not necessarily tracking. I do want to say, and I, it reminded me, that we are defining presence. Here. We are also voting, even though my amendment doesn't relate to that, and B, we're defining presence as in-person, virtual, or telephonic. So that, that, is, that is counts as presence. Now, if we wanted, I guess it would be appropriate to add there, at a, maybe at a future motion, I'll ask staff, that it should be delineated which form of presence <laughs> is, is, is council member presenting. But this, just to be clear, this defines presence as any one of those three options. Am I correct? Staff? Correct. I mean, presence is being defined to include in-person, virtual, as well as telephonic. Right. Uh, 
the stark intent was to recognize what's already happening right. and actually right. Of sure. course, this is a, it is a positive thing that virtue is an option, but it was simply to set, I mean, it's within the council's prerogative to set, you know, sure. whether that's an expectation or not. I appreciate that. No, I just wanted to be clear because I felt like that we kind of skipped over that, that we are changing the definition of presence to catch up with, we, with, with, with the, the private virtual. sector, <laughs> exactly. frankly, who, who are, you know, are doing, are in doing this, uh, have been doing this for a while. Um, so I, I, I would, I don't know if it's a, Maybe we dispose of this amendment, Mr. President, and then have a, I would certainly be fine with denoting, you'd have to amend B, so I think it's a separate motion. Yeah, but I, but theoretically, I'm not, I'm fine with that. So there's still, there's a motion on the floor that had a second. Yeah, we're going to go there next. So we've got a motion and a second to strike the language. Um, can you repeat it, Councilmember Tawanda? Strike, I got it. Uh, strike the language in... 2C after unreasonable. Um, all those in favor of the motion to strike the language in 2C after unreasonable, please raise your hands. That is one, two, three, four, five, six. All those opposed, that is three. So motion carries. Five, three. Five, three. Five, three. Five, That's right. We have somebody absent. Ironic. Um, all right. So let's move on to. The next, what the next item you mentioned, Councilmember Freeman? Yeah, well, why don't we? Because he already, it's already been discussed. We can dispose of what it seems like there's some consensus on item B, and, and, you know, without objection. And that would be just, and just to reiterate what Council Vice President Glass was noting. In presence, uh, it says, uh, you know, it ends with would be considered present, and then I think you could add there, and would be noted accordingly by the clerk in the minutes. Yeah, or, yeah, or so, something along those. Noted in the minutes? Where is it noted? Yeah, noted in, in, the, the, minutes. Minutes. in the minutes. In the minutes, yeah. yeah. The type of presence should be noted in the minutes. In the minutes or in the public record or in both? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, without objection. Great. Right. Yeah. Okay, then I just wanted to raise uh, an additional point here. We had, uh, there was discussion about committees, and, you know, it, it's, we have three different options in committees. The preference is in-person committee session. There are times when we do virtual committee sessions. And there are times when there is an in-person committee session, but one member, or maybe even two members, I suppose, participate virtually. And I don't know that necessarily we have to dictate that. We're changing the way that presence is determined at the council. That could hold true also for committees. But I do think if any part of the committee is in person, the person presiding over the committee also needs to be in person. So similarly, if we have if we have somebody is virtual, like you can't be the council president and preside over the meeting virtually. Like that doesn't work with other other people here. So I just think all meetings of the council that are, that have any component that is in person must be presided over by by somebody who is in per chaired by a person who's in person, whether that's a full council session by the council president, in their absence, the vice president steps in, we have a procedure for that. And similarly at a, a, a committee uh, structure, the person you know chairing or presiding over that committee would have to be uh, in, in person. So the virtual person can still participate, but just not Could chair. still participate, yeah. So like the council president, if the council president is at a conference, I don't think that they should not be able to participate if it's an excused, you know, we, we've agreed as a body that that's an appropriate way for them to participate. But it would be very difficult at a conference to preside over the meeting where the rest of us are in person, similarly for, for a committee. So I, I think we, we need to have that in the, in the rules and procedures. That, that's a good observation. And actually, we do have at page four of the memo, uh, there, is, there is a rule that specifies that. So, but it's under the, we do have that, provisions yeah, on the that, presiding that's, officer. This is what I was saying. This is only for the council session, the, the full council session I with see, the president and vice president. And I just want it to also be for committees. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Now. Okay, I understood. That's, uh, as reflected here, this relates to council meetings. Um, will we? Just to clarify, I'm looking at the rules now. Rule 1CD, the definition of a meeting 
um, includes a legislative session, a session of the district council, a meeting as a county board of health, a non-legislative session, and a work session. And so um, page four of the memo clarifies that a council member who presides at a meeting must be physically present. Does it say committee meeting? It says work session. Yeah, but, yeah. but so, that's a council so, work session. Yeah. yeah. Not a committee work session. No, and so a, we have work sessions at the full body. A quorum of a committee meeting is the president. So G given the interpretation of our Open Meetings Act, I would presume that a committee would be a work session. Yes. Right. Yes. So that would so so Sorry, the no. so the lang right. Well, is it Well, it's not because well, it, we we're changing we're we changing well, it's not just committee briefings, which is part of it, but but the we're changing what the definition of presence is. Right. And so if you're like the, the rules that you're referencing are the prior rules, we're ch saying that the, the the rules no longer apply in in the way that you're describing them. I would think, because we're saying what presence mean is not physical presence. It means telephonic. It means virtual, and it means in person. That's part B of two. Right. The goal is to add, I don't want to restate, but to add the committees to this, to make committees also, you can't preside over a committee session, a uh, meeting of, of a council committee unless in this same way. You have to either be, if someone is present, if, unless the whole thing is virtual, which happens from time to time, that's fine. The person, yeah. Or, but if some, if the, if whoever is in person, that person has to be, to chair that committee, they have to be in person. Correct. So right. w when we get to the the item five them. on the memo, where yeah. it says, um, in the absence of the president, the vice president presides at council meetings. Um, you just add a sentence can, about we committees. Can, you know, all yeah. you know, we can add council all committee meetings. Right. Yeah, that's okay. It. Yeah. Yeah. okay. Without objection. No, oh, that was easy. What's the next one? <laughs> okay, the next one is even easier. It's uh, creation of informal work groups uh, page. And I, just to back up a little bit, I should have said so in my introduction. The memo has nine pages. And just to make sure everyone can follow where we are. The memo has nine pages. And then after the memo, we have the circle numbers. So uh, Ms. Uh, McCartney Green will cover items nine through 15, I'm doing one through eight of the memo. So the next one is at page three of your memo and it relates to circle two. It's the creation of informal work groups. What we've done here is taken the definition of boards, committees, or commissions from the code and just brought that into the, um, into the rules. So it's a two part. On the one hand, we're expanding the definitions to just make it absolutely clear what a, what a, what a BCC is, board, committee, or commission, what a group is, and then we have a separate part of, the, of that, which is setting expectations or rules about how groups are formed. So uh, like I said, the uh, definition of a BCC is taken from the code and brought into the rules. Uh, the definition of a group has been expanded somewhat to say a, a group means any board, committee, commission, task force, or any similar multi-member body established by federal, state, or county law resolution or executive order that functions as part of the county government. And we're just trying to make it absolutely clear, this is not supposed to impact a, an individual council member's ability to, um, you know, to have, uh, you know, to, to, to tap into resources or, or, or set up, uh, you know, consultative uh, groups. Mm -hmm. But we're talking, we're talking about groups, page sorry, page three of the memo, page three of the memo, but we're setting a rule which says a council member must not form or establish any group without a council vote. So I was reading off of page three of the memo. So it's a, it's a, this, this particular revision is two part. On the one hand, we're expanding the definitions to make sure we're defining what a, what a group is, what a board committee or commission is, and then we're setting a rule which says, how do you go about forming a group that serves the council? If you're forming a group that serves the council, then that group should be formed by a vote of the council. Councilmember Katz. Thank you. My only concern on that is, I, 
if it's a group that's that's working for the entire council obviously it makes sense if it's a group that's working for the council member only then that council member should be allowed to have their own group that's and if you read right, yeah. but if you read it this way it, it says a council member must not form or establish any kind of group yeah, for oh, your yeah, own? that's not yeah that, that's a good question but the term group has been defined yeah, to be a board committee or commission or task force that functions as part of the county government group means any board committee. so an informal group that advised the council member on a set of issues would not count as a group under this definition. correct could could we put clarifying language in there that says that because i i mean you know i mean just to be clear right okay these things get awfully uh, fuzzy at some point <clears throat> Is that a motion, Ms. Councilmember Katz? Yeah. yeah, I think yeah. without objection. Thanks. All right, next. The next one is item four in the memo. It addresses closed meetings. And uh, this is, uh, it's simply a clarifying amendment to the rules. Uh, there may have been some misunderstandings or misconceptions about whether council members are being asked to sign some kind of an NDA to attend uh, meeting so with removing the provision that says a council member or authorized council staff must not be required to sign a confidentiality or non-disclosure agreement that's being removed altogether and we're adding just restating what is already required in the open meetings law that the record of a closed meeting should include a record of who's present and a reminder of what the open meetings law obligations are with regard to confidentiality and back to the issue of virtual meetings, uh, if anyone's attending the meeting virtually, then the fact that they were reminded of this will be noted by the clerk in the record. Without objection. The next item is item five in the memo, at page four of the memo, and it relates to circle three, if you wanted to look at the actual rule. And this is just uh, uh, clarifying what the sequence of um, presiding over council meetings shall be when the council president is is absent. So in the absence of the president, it's the vice president who will preside at the meeting and we're adding some clarifying language to make it clear this is just presiding at a meeting. Uh, in the absence of the president and the vice president, if the council hasn't previously elected uh, a president pro tempore, the most recent past president in attendance and who is on council would preside. This is also where we had the language that the council member who presides must be physically present. We will add the clarifying language to make it clear this is just not, not just for council, but for council and committees. Go ahead, Councilman Friedson. So we're going to add physically present since, or present in person, I think is the verbiage that's used in part two. And then you're going to add language that also references for a committee for an in-person committee session the presiding officer of that committee session would have to be present in person for an in-person meeting so what we say here is a council member who presides at a meeting maybe we should say at a council or committee meeting yeah. must be physically present if, 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 oh I, I see what you mean yes yes physically present in in yes <laughs> I think you could say if the president is absent yeah at a at an in-person council meeting I mean I just we use in person as the verbiage in part right. two so I just think we should be consistent whether you know physical in per, like whatever it is we should just pick what that verbiage is I think we all know what it means but I think it should just be consistent throughout the if, document if, if the meeting is in person then the person who presides must also be in person correct yeah. correct because it's arguably could have a meeting with everyone being virtual in which case the order wouldn't change and I will note absence covers that on the front end so correct. like th th that person would be absent in all aspects because we've defined what presence is so then we now defined alternatively I presume what absence is so anyway, just, yeah, I think we're all in agreement here, but it needs to be worse. Right? Okay. 
The next one is on page five of the memo. It's item six, and it's regarding online uh, publication. And with this one, we're just, it's clarifying language that's being added here to ensure that, um, you know, like we said, these rules predate the time when meetings were virtual. And the assumption is that you had physical copies of everything. So we're just making it absolutely clear that um, if, the, if there's going to be a public hearing and it's remote or it's, it, you know, th that materials would be made available electronically. We have to be absolutely careful because some things have to be advertised in the newspaper and we're not changing any of that. But we're just making it absolutely clear that um, uh, materials for meetings will be made available on the website and electronically. We also have some provisions there for public notice in the event of an emergency and um, making it clear that that can be posted online. Okay. Without objection. That's also the spirit of the next one. Uh, item seven, electronic copies. Uh, the pre is without objection. Okay. Yep. Uh, item eight: publication of amendments. Uh, I need to pause here a little bit and just uh, with this one, there's no substantive change. Uh, this rule tracks the chronology of a bill, and what we've done, even though this language and, and based on the testimony we we got from the public hearing, this might not have been fully understood. Even though it shows here that we are removing, Rule 6 spells out the sequence of a bill from ad introduction, advertising, scheduling, and so on. So all we've done here is we're taking the word amendments to legislation and replacing it with the word bills. Because the way it was before was a little bit confusing. You had the sequence, and then in the middle of the sequence, you had a reference to amendments to legislation and it was misconstrued as being an amendment to a bill. So there's really no substantive change except to track the whole sequence of a bill. No advertising requirements are changing here. No objection? No, nope. nope. Councilmember Juwando. No, no objection, question. just a question. So uh, the this, this is Relating to the amendment, okay, this is just tracking it and related to the amendment. Correct. Okay. But, I mean, previously you had, you know, if you looked at, if you go to the actual rule, rule six, it starts by, you know, it talks about the president scheduling something, it talks right. about publication and advertising, and about halfway down, it says amendments to legislation, which can be misunderstood as being an amendment to the bill would have to be advertised again. So we're just, Clear. we're rewording it and making it clearer okay. we think thank you well, at least that's the goal thank you you've cleared it up for me sure and i turn it over to miss mccartney green to take over from there thank you i think i have the easier part of the rules i hope so uh so we're on page six uh <laughs> I know, right? page six uh, uh number nine advanced notice of public hearings and so rule four provides the requirements for a public hearing um, including the publication of a public hearing the recommendation here by staff is to uh, change the amount of days that it's advertised from 15 to 14. With that, we actually looked at the Maryland Constitution and it's 14 days, a minimum of 14 days is required for publication of um, a public hearing. And so with our current process with the 15 days, that puts us into three weeks and um, causes a little bit of headache with scheduling. And so the recommendation here is to have 14 days and found that to be consistent with what's in the Maryland Constitution. We're changing it there, and we're also changing it for Board of Health regulations that also requires um, publication as well. No objection. Moving along, uh, number 10, expiration of resolution. And so uh, council staff took a look at the, the rules and noticed mm -hmm. that uh, resolution expires uh, the next August 31st, 31st after introduction. Um, could not find a rhyme or reason for that. Um, we did take a look at other jurisdiction and realized that they had a fixed time. And so the recommendation here is instead of having that August 31st date to actually say that resolutions um, expires 180 days after it is introduced unless the council adopts or defeats it sooner 
by a motion or extend it to a specific date. Uh, Council Vice President Glass. I'm hoping that this is the appropriate time to bring up another issue, right? Since we're talking about uh, expiration of resolutions, I would like to actually bring up expiration of legislation. Would now be the time to do that? I, I would say let's let's see if we the council agrees on the 180 okay. days, and then we can jump into the res, uh, legislation as well. Sounds good. Councilmember Juwando. Yeah, I think this is, I do have a question on this, but I, I, on the other issue, I thought we talked about that and this was only stuff that we decided to move forward. Obviously, anyone can bring something forward, but so we'll have that conversation. On this one, I thought we had said um, a year or, you know, how did we land on 180? I remember 180 because it was kind of arbitrary based on, this is kind of half a year-ish, right? Right. And, and what so- What was the logic there again? Well, we looked at other jurisdictions as well. And we, I, I'm not mistaken, it was in Arundel County that may have also set 180. I mean, we looked at 30 and said that obviously that wouldn't work, right? Yeah. And 60 and 90, yeah, I think. In fact, was, I, th I think Anne Arundel may have had 90. days. It was shorter. Exactly. So we actually went with a longer period of time. So the, it was just kind of looking at what other, there was no like other substantive reason. It's okay. No, I'm just asking. No, there was not. <laughs> okay. We thought this was better than the August 31st date. That, 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 you, well, the August 31st date doesn't make any sense because right. it depends on when you do stuff. The only thing I would think is that we have had various rules in the past around budget, like not doing things to, that are extraneous during budget, which is a 90-day, you know, depends on the, you know, period-ish. So if you, if you uh, introduced a resolution, you could, a lot of your time could get eaten up, and then there's other things that happen. I just, I don't know what we're trying to solve for here. So I, I thought... Uh, it seemed I remember the conversation of that it, a year would be reasonable, but um, is is there something is there anything in your mind that we're trying to guard against of other than staleness? But you know I don't think it's a bill could stay for the whole four years, right? You know so well, eighteen months. Uh, eighteen months. I'm sorry, not a whole four years. Eighteen months. Yeah. So what? And if there's nothing, that's okay. But I just. It was nothing. I think 180 days was a reasonable factor. And you thought it was so, reasonable. Okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't reasonable. feel very strongly. I just wanted to understand the, I guess if it's resolutions, hopefully or not, we had one recently that was not Right. Normal. And they usually pass, you know, yeah. traditionally. Yeah. I mean, normally, they normally do. So, okay. I, I'm not going to make a motion. I just wanted to understand. Thank you. Council Member Rice. So again, none of my business is I'm leaving, but it just doesn't make a lot of sense. I don't know why you just don't keep it consistent. I mean, whatever it is for bills, why, why wouldn't it just be the same for resolutions and call it a day? Yeah, bills is 18 months, and so we thought that was very much of a, of a longer runway than opposed to the 180 days. And then looking at a history of resolutions, um, they're usually passed uh, within the time frame that they're introduced. And so we thought 100 a days, 180 days was actually a long time just considering looking at the history of resolutions that are introduced over time for the council. Like I said, I don't, know. I don't feel either way. It's just for ease and consistency, it would just be easier to have it the same. Everything expires the same time frame, so everybody knows it. But uh, there's no rhyme or reason, just like with 180 days. I mean, it's like we're just picking from the air, right? But I mean, that, 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 that just to me would make it easier for folks from consistency. But I'm not going to make a motion because it's none of my business. <laughs> All right. So, okay. So no, no objection to this one, correct? Yeah. No. Wait. I'm going to you next. Okay. Okay. So Council Vice President. Eighty days have been. Yep. Okay. We're good. Uh, but Council Vice Yeah. Uh, but uh, Council Vice President Glass. Great. Thank you, Mr. President. So uh, now that we agree with that recommendation, I want to just broaden out the conversation to expiration of legislation. Uh, right now, as has been noted in this conversation, legislation uh, has a lifespan of 18 months or otherwise it naturally expires. Um, Montgomery County seems to be the only jurisdiction I am aware of, at least in the D.C. region, but I would like to learn from elsewhere, uh, where legislation does not naturally expire at the end of the term. Congress works that way, Annapolis works that way, the District of Columbia, Prince George's, end every year. Uh, and so it struck me as odd four years ago, and I know it struck some of my colleagues odd, and hopefully it, you know, it, was a, it was a learning experience for everybody who serves on the council upon getting there the first day, first week or two, and voting on legislation 
or being in committee and taking up legislation that former council members who are no longer there had introduced and that you, in some instances, didn't get to sit through the hearing. You didn't get to talk to constituents, but yet here it is and you're voting on it because of the 18-month lifespan. Uh, and I think that we should conform to the norm, which is what all other b legislative bodies do. And I think 18 months is great during the term of that session, but when the clock strikes midnight and that session ends, so does all legislation before it. Now, I say that acutely aware of the conversations that are happening today. The, the hearings that we had, pending legislation, I get it. And a lot of that is very important. But I think there's a broader policy at stake. And we need to talk about the body and doing what's right for incoming members of the council. And there's a four-year term. And that is a long runway for folks. And if something is so incredibly important and that council member is returning, they can reintroduce it immediately. Or another council member can pick up the mantle and champion the cause, as so many of us have championed causes that previous council members have once championed. But I think it is important to conform to a normal structure where legislation during a term, if not passed, expires at the end of the term, and I'd like to make that motion. Okay, we've got a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I'll second it. We can discuss it. Second, then by Council Member Friedson. Council Friedson, did you want to talk about it now? Okay. Okay. Council Member Rice. So uh, it's more of just a question. So something like Thrive, for example, if we hadn't gotten to it by, you know, November 29th would expire? Oh, it's easy. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. That, yeah, and that also has, I mean, we had to extend that multiple times and because it has specific timelines because it's a land use. Yeah, and on land use zoning. matters, they do expire. Yeah. Yeah. If, if I could, if Please. we knew things were to expire, we might act differently. This is about setting it up for the next council and having people come in and not have to vote on legislation of which they've had no conversation about. That's why things in Annapolis, in which you're very familiar, expire at sine die. Well, and so, the reason uh, it, well, <laughs> not so long there's long. a reason that that happens in Annapolis, it happens on the Hill, it happens in other councils all throughout this country and this region. Um, and I think if there's a natural shot clock, that's not 18 months, but four years, really, to get that work done, we might act differently. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's an interesting one. I mean, you know, um, not everything is great about Annapolis. It's the reason why I left. So I'll just say that. Um, so I don't know if we want to model everything like Annapolis. I'll just leave that there. Um, that being said, um, you know, th there, are, there are pluses and minuses to this. Obviously, the pluses are you start off with a clean slate. The minuses are that you have great work that the council's done and, and taken up uh, that could be beneficial and you have to start over again. That's a challenge. Um, you know, it, it, it's not one where I could see it as something that's, you know, you'll have people that'll try and rush stuff through towards the end of terms and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's not necessarily helpful. Um, creates a little bit of consternation and angst amongst uh, all of the folks that's there. And, you know, we, we refer to it as one individual council member. The reality is, is that oftentimes these are legislative matters that are uh, co-sponsored by other individuals too. So it's not just one person. Um, so we shouldn't phrase it that way. It's, you know, whoever the sponsors of the legislation are, which again, again, I, 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 I try and guide you guys um, from my 12 years of wisdom on the council in terms of trying to avoid the infighting, the kind of issues that you may have. This could be another one that rears its ugly head from that perspective. You, you, you know, why, why create a problem if there's not a problem? Um, the reality is, is that I mean, if you, if you take up something, you don't have to vote on it. You could say, I don't like this bill. I want to take more time. That's what council members have done. I mean, it's what we did with, granted, it's not the same, but with Thrive and other kinds of things. I mean, council members have always said, look, you know, I need more time to understand this and to take it up and can do that. That's within the power of the body. And so from that standpoint, I just don't think that artificially creating something that you can already do as a body um, makes sense and then enshrining that and into your policy, but I, I get it. I understand why it is that you're wanting to do those things. And trust me, as a person 
who came onto this council who had to vote on a uh, budget savings plan, who had to vote on whether or not to veto uh, legislation dealing with uh, Clarksburg uh, and the taxing district and all kinds of stuff. See, I remember this stuff, Marlene. Um, all of these things, I, trust me, I understand. Um, but at the same time, you know, we figure it out. We're council members. It's what we do. And so I think from that standpoint, I think it's fine the way it is, but, you know, I'm not going to follow my sword over it. So, uh, Councilmember Jawando. Thank you. I appreciate the, the, the sage wisdom from my departing colleague. Uh, um, yeah, I think, you know, it, it, all bodies are different. And, you know, I take the points that you make about Annapolis, which is a three month, you know, you can go I can make a long list of what's wrong with Annapolis. I think they should all get paid more, you know, go down the list. But it's a diff that's a different type of body. It's a part time legislature. Congress, where I'm very familiar, having worked as staff, there's less artificial barriers to introducing. You just, you know, I've done it many times before. You run down to the, 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 the well or the door where you introduce a bill, you it, throw it in, it's introduced. There's, you don't have to wait for anybody, you don't have to ask anybody, it's, it's in there. We've created a lot of artificial for good reasons, I think, you know, process, staff time, ways to limit introductions of bills, whether it be budget, the amount of time the president put it on the schedule. So we have already artificially kind of condensed time when you can introduce bills. You add to that all the work and the public engagement and the committee work that goes into, uh, you know, the, the hearings, everything that happens when people gear up for a bill. I, I don't think that should just be you know, have to be recreated for an artificial deadline. I, I think that, you know, if we want to go back, the new council members, I agree with you. It was a little odd when we came in and we had to take that stuff up, but I think it's unique to this body. And if, and one of the things I would tell the new members, you know, go back and we're working on decarbonization, go back and read the record, listen to those hearings um, and make a decision about what you want to do, whether you want to move forward or not. Um, so I, I think uh, because of the type of body we are, and we are year round and we already have kind of artificial barriers in place to when legislation can be introduced and how it's worked on by staff. I don't, I don't know what problem we're trying to solve. So I, I don't think uh, we have to do this. I appreciate the, the, the thoughtfulness of the offer, but I think it's, I don't think we're, it's a problem. Okay. Councilmember Navarro followed by Councilmember Friedson. Then I have some comments on this too. Councilmember Navarro. Thank you. I will uh, echo my, Colleague Councilmember uh, Rice, this is just part of the sage advice. Obviously, it's kind of weird to be taking these things up because we're not going to be here. But uh, you know, I, I understand um, where Councilman Vice President Glass is coming from. One of the things that I always treasured about our way of governing is that there isn't an interruption, right? That there's continuity. Um, and it's something that was just ingrained in my mind um, because, of course, the history of countries in Latin America, where every time there is a shift, everything that was, you know, on the pipeline gets thrown away and then you have to start from scratch. And so I always appreciated the fact that there was this continuity. Um, I also appreciated how tough it was, and especially for me, I came in the middle of a term to have to then hit the ground running and, you know, study up as, as quickly as possible and make an informed decision. So I understand that. But again, to me, you know, having that continuity is so important. Uh, and hopefully everybody works hard to not leave too many things, um, you know, for the, for the next uh, council. But I also don't really see it as, a, as an issue. I think the council traditionally in its history has always done a really good job in making sure that there is that continuity of work uh, in a seamless transition. So, I, I personally, I just don't see why it would be necessary, but it's just advice. Uh, Councilman Friedson, and then I'll make my comments. Yeah, I appreciate it. You know, I, I appreciate Council Vice President Class bringing this forward. I, I think it's an interesting conversation for us to have. It impacts, I introduced a bill today. So, I, you know, I will just note that. Uh, but I, you know, I thought about this and I thought, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I would be okay personally. The, the work has been done on the bill. So reintroducing this in a few weeks for the new council for their benefit, you know, is not something that would bother me personally. I mean, I thought about that, you know, specifically my team has spent, you know, months and months and months and months and months trying to work uh, on, on this uh, on this bill. 
And I don't think any of that work is, would go away if we were reintroducing it. And the benefit would be that a public hearing, for instance, which you know probably for this anyway would be for the new council, but if we had submitted this a month ago, there's a good chance the public hearing would be now. And that public hearing would be happening for a council that's departing without the benefit of the public's formal institutionalized input being before the very people who are going to take the vote. And so I do think that there are some institutional challenges that we have where it would make sense to have a natural end. You know, we are referred to as a numbered council. The next council will be a new numbered council, not differently than the Congress every two years is referred to as a numbered Congress. And uh, for the next council to be voting on bills that uh, were introduced and perhaps even discussed and deliberated uh, w without them, uh, for the public to be providing input in their formal way um, to council members who aren't going to vote on it and not to council members who are, I mean, I do think that there are some real questions that we ought to, to, to think about there. So I, I appreciate it. I mean, it would impact me, I, I will say. It would impact my team. Uh, but I think the, uh, the, 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 the benefits to the public probably outweigh some of the drawbacks of things that we'd have to work through and, and work out. So I, I would be supportive uh, of this change, noting that I would, uh, just so everybody knows, <laughs> would be reintroducing the bill that I introduced uh, today. Uh, at the earliest possible uh, moment pending the uh, support of the next council president. <clears throat> uh, but I just wanted to note that. Thank you. Sure. So um, I understand and agree with, in principle, what Council Vice President Glass is articulating and what he wants to move forward. My problem is, is that we haven't done any sort of comprehensive assessment or evaluation of the current bills that are pending that will transition over to the next council. And we just did one today that is complicated because we also have to remember the timing is such that the new council will only have two sessions before we go into one month recess. And there are things that come up that, for example, the public health officer position, we introduced legislation today to get going the creation of the office so that although we appointed Dr. Davis today, um, Dr. Bridgers is not yet able to begin the process of formulating his team or the organizational structure until we create the legislation that formally creates his position. And we would now have to wait until probably February, best case scenario, um, if it has to be reintroduced over the new council. And so that's two months in the time of public health when you know uh, we've got real challenges before us. Um, over the next couple of months with flu season, RS I've got a kid at home right now with RSV. So, um, so I, 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 we should have done this a year ago if we were going to do this, because um, then it also would have allowed the executive branch to plan and organize some of their um, legitimate administrative functions um, in advance. And so, I would support this four years from now. Um, but because of the timing, I just I, I don't support it at the moment, um, even though I, I think it's a reasonable suggestion. So uh, Council Member Katz wanted to speak, and then let's move on, folks. It's 4.30, and we still have a, another thing we got to do today. Council Member Katz. Thank you, Mr. President. I, yeah, this is a difficult one, and I'm, um, this is perhaps the only time in the history of Montgomery County that there's a new majority coming in. And that in itself changes the whole, the whole feel for what is going to happen. Um, and I only I believe that it's only fair that that those who are voting on it had the opportunity to participate in the discussions. And if we don't do it this way, then that's not that's not allowed. Um, could this though? I do appreciate the fact that we're doing it last minute and. Anybody that had introduced legislation or continuing legislation, like today we the discussions for the work session, could this be written in such a way that it actually goes into effect six months from now or three months from now or whatever, so at least it gets straightened out for the future rather than what we're doing right now? 
because if that would be the case, I certainly, I, I'm supportive of it the way it is now. I think I'd, I know I'd be more supportive of it if we could get through the immediate and then correct what we what we've been doing. But the fact that you're having a new majority come in, and and uh, either we should go back to a public hearing or a public discussion, so that everyone is a has a fair has a fair shot at what they're doing. They couldn't ask any questions. They couldn't do anything with it. So, I I would support the legis what is the the proposal right now. I prefer that we extend it out so that it kicks in in six months. Thank you, Mr. President. All right. Uh, thank you. Did anybody else have any other thoughts on this? No. Nope. Councilman Reamer. Well, go ahead. I'm sorry. Or should I while you? So, so uh, I hear the council president. I hear Council Member Katz both saying that uh, they appreciate and actually support the intention, but the timing might not work, and that both would actually like it to be applied uh, four years from now. Um, the well, I, I mean, it, it's at the end of the term or 180 days, so it still would be the status quo uh, essentially. Uh, and so, whether or not it can be written to start that clock, I don't know uh, for for the next council. But I guess the point there being, uh, you know, folks in the next council need the foresight and to engage in this a year before. And I guess that's the moral of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilmember Reamer, uh, you, you might introduce. I mean. You can introduce a change of procedure at the beginning of the new council. You just yeah. need more votes. And that's not necessarily insurmountable. So something to consider is just introduce this at the beginning of the new council. Uh -huh. And then there's plenty of time to work it through. Um, I mean, my own comment here is I think the consequence of this is the county council will do less. Uh, that's all. Uh, because you're going to be removing a certain amount of time from the calendar and creating some uncertainty towards the end of the year. Um, and, you know, that might not be a bad thing. I don't know. I think the history of the council is the council has invested itself with great powers. And that's why this law is the way it is, or this procedure is the way it is. Um, but, uh, you know, I remember when I first joined the council, actually, Craig Rice will remember this. We came in and there was legislation on bargaining that had been introduced in the fall and in order to move quickly during the Great Recession. So kind of, a, you know, you, gotta, you can look at that two ways. It was a very controversial issue where we arrived new to the council midstream. It was extremely difficult. On the other hand, it was an emergency type measure intended to grapple with some of the challenges. Uh, and, you know, waiting three months had the consequence. So it's, it's really tricky. It is tricky. All right. Well, uh, we got a motion and a second. Um, do you still, let's still vote on it. All right. All those in favor of the motion and second. Is there, so there's not an amendment to the motion then for the timing? Is, this I, is that possible? I don't know. Yes, that would be considered a subsidiary motion or an amendment to the original motion on the floor that was offered by Councilmember Katz to amend. If that's possible, I'm, I'll support it as a friendly amendment for sure. What, what is possible? It, it was not going to effect until six months from now. Can I comment? I mean, before you do that, I, can I comment? Yep, yep, Councilmember. I just Toronto. think, you know, it's interesting we're discussing this in the context of this amendment. You know, we got a new council coming in in a couple of weeks that has 90 days with six votes to update any of these rules. I, I don't know why we would put something in place that co coincides with that clock <laughs> when they can just consider it when we start, to Councilman yeah. Reamer's point. So I, I don't think, uh, and, you know, because it wouldn't have any effect on right now, the bills that would continue, it would just force us to talk about it then with them, which I don't but know why. Well, if you set a time certain that the bills expire, oh, yeah. if that's what I'm understanding the friendly amendment, it would it would every bill that wasn't taken up by 60, 90 days, whatever the date is, would that would end, whether it, regardless of where it is on its 18 month time cycle, and then so this the council, the new council, in the midst of everything else, would have to we'd have to get a the analysis that council president was talking about that we don't have, and go through everything. I just I I think it 
it's unnecessary. So I, I wouldn't support that either. A, a continuation of that theory, Council Member Jawando, is that none of this really is necessary, that all of it could just be taken up by the next council. But clearly, we have to set some rules and parameters more than simply changing the number of uh, council members from 9 to 11. There are a number of issues here that we're taking up that will affect the next council, and we've agreed upon some of those. This is just one of, one more. I, I agree. I just think this one's a little different in that it just you're talking about the finality of ending a bill. When how you request to show up to council, those are things that we can change any time. But if you end a bill, it's ended, and all the work that went into it, the public session, the work sessions, all that is discarded and will have to be done again. And that has that has a lot more consequence than I think some of these things do. So, but I understand your point. All right, uh, we got a motion and a second. Um, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your hands. That is Councilmember Friedson, Council Vice President Glass, and Councilmember Katz. All those opposed, raise your hands. That is Councilmember Rice, Councilmember Jawando, Councilmember Reamer, and Councilmember Navarro. So the motion does not carry. Um, moving on, next item. Still on page seven, number 11, seating time. Uh, rule nine addresses procedures at a public hearing. Uh, specifically, the recommendation here from staff is to remove the last sentence as in Rule 9C, which says, to cede time to another speaker, a speaker must be present at the hearing. Uh, this provision is uh, necessary because the rules already give the uh, presiding officer uh, or the council president or the council the opportunity to uh, limit the number of speakers in the allotted time. And so the provision that actually says to cede time to another speaker um, is not necessary. And so this is a clarifying amendment to, to remove that. No objection. Uh, moving on to uh, number 12, transcript. This is also another clarifying amendment um, that updates our rules to say that uh, a transcript of a council meeting is only required by law. Uh, right now, the way how it's written in the rules is that it's required um, by law and if, or if there's a request of the president or the majority of the council members in office with sufficient notice. Uh, transcripts are costly and um, do uh, take up a significant amount of, of, of time and the uh, council uh, procedures now has an opportunity to have timestamp videos and recordings and so with that um, just would be a clarifying amendment to say that a transcript of a public hearing uh, must only be made available if it's required by law. No objection. Uh, moving on number 13 advance notice of an agenda item um, and so except in emergencies this would require council members um, to provide the president a written draft of a, of a potential agenda item. Um, this could be a resolution or a legislation at least eight days prior to the council, to the council session. Uh, this is just a prudent matter just to be able for the council president to be able to be well, in, well aware in advance of what's going to be in the agenda and for um, staff to have the opportunity to have the time to uh, prepare for up upcoming agenda items. No objection. Uh, moving on, number 14 on page 8 of the, of the memo, uh, council correspondence. And so previously this council ad adopted a, a council correspondence policy um, that provides a format for, for memos and letters sent to external entities. Um, in accordance with that policy, um, there, was a, there was a suggestion that an amendment to the rules should also be there to clarify that a letter expressing a position or an opinion on behalf of the council um, should have some parameters. And so council staff has provided here as an amendment um, that says if the council determines by a majority vote that written correspondence is needed to express an op opinion on behalf of the body, the correspondence may state the names of the council members in support and each council member in opposition of the position and be signed by the president or the president designee. Further, the amendment explains a council member or a group of council members individually or collectively may send external correspondence that expresses a position, but in doing so, the correspondence may state the written position is not on behalf of the council. That was a mouthful. I do want to just stop there and just say that this was a suggested amendment of, of looking at um, just dialogue that we received from council members. But uh, in continuing with that, council member Friedson, I know has some other uh, comments as well and uh, may have other suggestions. Yes, council member Friedson. Thank you. Well, first of all, I appreciate staff putting this forward. I appreciate the uh, effort of staff to try to put forward an amendment to capture what I was attempting to do. I'm not sure it quite does. And so I have an alternative that is, I think, much simpler. I'm a little concerned about 
this seems very complicated, number one. Number two, it seems like we're creating like a Supreme Court style dynamic with, you know, majority opinions and minority reports. And, uh, you know, I just think it, you know, we, we're going to, you know, we, we confuse enough people sitting at this dais. We'll be confusing people even further when we're sending correspondence that talks about what we talk about uh, from, from, from this uh, dais. So uh, my suggestion uh, is uh, to have something that's much simpler. And it would just say that the council president must have support of at least a majority of council members to send correspondence in the capacity as council president and must note whether such correspondence is on behalf of a majority of the body or as the council's unanimous view. So uh, that that's the first part. I have a second part. The reason for that is this. If you send something on behalf of the, uh, as council president, in your capacity as council president, you should have to have the will of the majority in order to do so, number one. And number two, I think it is only appropriate and really should be necessary that you know whether this is a majority opinion, you know, providing the opportunity for an individual council member to have a different opinion and share that different opinion and note that, it, you know, that not everybody had that view. Uh, and uh, or if it's a unanimous view, that this was a, a, a nine nothing vote of the council, you note that it's a unanimous view and we send something to Annapolis or to the federal government or whatever the case may be. So that's part one. I don't think personally it's necessary to have the names listed out of who supported and who didn't support and then, you know, kind of necessitate a opposition letter that explains the opposition view. I, I think that seems uh, unnecessary and probably unhelpful to the to the body having a view. Uh, and then the second piece of this would say council members may individually or jointly send correspondence in their individual capacity capacities and may include their title or titles, but must clearly note they are speaking they are, must clearly note that they are not speaking on behalf of the body. So th what this means is what has always been the practice, what, what should continue to be the practice, any council member as an independent election official can send correspondence at any time. And what this is clarifying is that you, if you're council president or you chair a committee or you are lead for something that you can, that can be noted, that could be on your letterhead, for instance, and most council members have some connotation to their title uh, on their letterhead, but you would be required and expected to note that you are corresponding in writing in your individual capacity as a council member, not as council president on behalf of the body, not as a committee on behalf of the committee, not as a lead on behalf of you know an entity or, or whatever the case may be. So to, to me, I think this is much simpler and, and, and easier. I think it captures what I believe we were attempting uh, to do. And I think the two major things are number one, majority versus unanimous view, which we, we wanna note that. Number two, to make sure that when the council president is speaking, the council president has the will of the body before doing so. Uh, and number three, if you are speaking in your individual capacity that you are required to note that you are speaking in your individual capacity, you know, affirmatively so that by being silent on it doesn't create the uh, belief that, that you may uh, be speaking on behalf of others. So I, I put that forward as a, a you know, a, a, an amendment to uh, number 14 council correspondence here. Okay, we got a motion by Councilmember Friedson, a second by Council Vice President Glass. Um, is there any discussion on this? Councilmember Juando. Uh, my seatmate here leaned over and said that was, <laughs> that was simpler. <laughs> um, I appreciate the, the intent. I, I think, uh, I remember when we had this discussion. So just so I'm clear, a Five, people, five or six people in the new council decide they want to send a letter on something. Council president signs it. No names other than the council president are on the letter under what you're proposing. You could. Well, you could do either. The, the, the point here is it's not saying that you can't send a letter where everybody signs it. It's saying that we have decided that we have a structure here where their council president one of the main duties of the council president, there's really only two duties. Number one, preside over the meetings of the full council. And number two, serve as the spokesperson for the body. Right. So we have to have a mechanism where we allow the council president to serve as the spokesperson, not just at Monday sessions at 11 a.m., but also through written correspondence. And so the idea here was to create 
ground rules for what is appropriate and, and not appropriate. It wouldn't prevent what council members do all the time and not necessarily through the council president, individual council members what I'm, what I'm trying to collecting ask. signatures of a letter that they want. Is there just a signatures. signature of the president for those six members and not the members? That's what I'm trying to understand. Yeah, in this, in, in what I'm suggesting, the council president would be able to send a letter as council right. president on behalf of a majority. Right. And it so wouldn't necessarily the, where, have to have the signatures of the six or so seven little, or eight members. I, the, the, the concern I have with that, I agree that council president should be able to send the letter and their name should be first and it's, it's official position. You should say this is a majority member. I, all that's fine. The only problem I have is just the transparency piece to the public. I think we talk about a lot of important things. I can think of a couple times where this happens where people want to know who's who's on favor of that position and who isn't. And, and if, if there's just one name on it and it's a minority, if it's a, if it's a full council thing, there's no issue. I have absolutely should just have the, the one name. But if it's a 6-5, um, I think there is benefits to the public and transparency to know who's on who signed it and who didn't. And so I, I would just, my concern would be that if there is a 6-5, the you know, you, it's in, it's kind of a it's a less transparent practice to not have the names. So I I would agree that the president consented in in a, in a case. So my my preference would be that if it's a not, if it's a unanimous, the president sends it with no no other names. If it's not unanimous, that the people who are signing it should sign it with the council president's name first. And then on the other thing, any group of council members can send a letter. I, the second part of your thing, I don't have a problem with. As far as if I understand it correctly, you're saying if you and I want to send a letter to somebody, we have to put this is our view and not the view of the body. There's some language. Is that is that what you're saying? Yeah, it, yeah. It's it's it, 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 you are you should that you should in our names just being well. On? Yes, but the point is is that sometimes you're going to have letterhead, for instance, that says you are, you know, the lead, the vice president, the Maybe president, the chair. Them. The, and, and rather than dictating to a council member what letterhead they're allowed to use for what correspondence, which I think is micromanaging adults uh, here who are independently elected, here it's just setting the expectation in our rules that if you are corresponding and you're not corresponding on behalf of the body, that you make it clear that you're not corresponding on behalf of the way. body. Yeah, I'm speaking in my capacity as the at-large council member for Montgomery Perfect. County. You know, something, I'm fine it, we're not dictating what that means. We're just saying that it should be expected. Yeah. That you do it just like if you went and testified in Annapolis, you would say, "Hi, I'm yeah, Councilmember Will Juando, at large from Montgomery County." You know, in my individual in, in my individual capacity, capacity as, a, as my capacity as a council member. Fine. Or if Gabe Albernaz, you know, went to the transportation priorities hearing and he was testifying on something that hadn't been vetted by colleagues, he could say, "Hi, I'm Councilmember, you know, Albernaz. I'm here. You know, I serve as council president for the year, but I'm here as my individual." In my individual capacity, providing you with my, you know, beliefs as a as an elected official, not on behalf of the yeah. body would that you, I was elected for the year to represent. Could because, we? So I'm fine with the second yeah. part. Could we? Would Would you consider a friendly amendment to the first part that if it's not unanimous that the the names be listed with the council president first? I just think that we we we're based on majority rules, and I just think that we have to allow. I mean, I think a council member can request that. Uh, in any uh, okay. moment, but I don't want to take away the ability for the council president to be able to send a letter on behalf of the majority, and I'm not and, taking and, it away. I'm and, 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 and and do that. I, I think I think in very rare instances, as you are talking about, it, I mean, I think this is trying to cover all instances. There are very rare instances where I think you might be right, where there might be something that is very controversial, where it would be of a public interest for people to understand how folks came down and I think council members could request that that be noted and that could be part of the discussion that the council could have because remember you have to come up with the majority here to agree to send the letter in the first place so I, I think to me that that would be could, that, that could easily be covered on a case-by-case -case basis but it wouldn't require like for instance if somebody is out of town or ill or whatever and there's something that is I agree. Totally non-controversial to make it seem like they were opposed right. to it, you know, would, would concern me. As long, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so I think um, so. Right. Uh, we'll we'll move that. I do not have the energy to talk about this right now, but the next council will have to think about a scenario in which the majority wants the council president to send a letter, and the and the council president says no thanks because they may disagree with the policy. 
that has happened. So, but I don't want to take that up right now. Um, I think we need to, you know, be thoughtful about how to address a situation like that if it were to arise. So, do Ms. McCartney Green, do you do you have the? So, for clarity, the, the council is <laughs> going to accept Councilmember Friedman's uh, proposal with the amendments that he presented. Correct. Correct. Yes, for an answer. yes. Yes, just okay. with the understanding that <laughs> council member can yep. request to have the name. I heard that's what I heard in legislative history today. So, our uh, number fifteen on page nine, uh, moving forward to introduction of special appropriation. Um, the purpose of this amendment here is to um, set some parameters or safeguards and to strengthen fiscal responsibility when it comes to special appropriations. Uh, right now, there is no threshold for an introduction of a special appropriation. Uh, the amendment here is before the introduction of a special appropriation, a resolution must have a sponsor and the support of two or more council members to introduce a special appropriation. Council Vice President Glass. Uh, I appreciate this. I, I think this recommendation is important as the council goes from 9 to 11. Uh, there have not been guardrails around our special appropriation process. And as we start entering uncharted uh, budgetary, the budgetary horizon, um, I think it is important to put some guardrails around one of the most powerful uh, authorizations that this body has, which is the power of the purse. And where right now it's one person can introduce something, this recommendation is for a minimum of three people to support it prior to introduction. Um, I, I think that is really important uh, in a body of 11 because anything that is truly a special appropriation, something that has to be done at that moment in time, um, should very much garner the support of the entire body. That's exactly what happened during COVID, where I believe every single special appropriation for probably a six-month period during the pandemic was unanimously introduced. And if something does not have the support of a majority, or even in this case, three, then there's a budget process for that. And we have a very robust budget process for a 6.3 and probably larger budget moving forward. Um, and I would actually like to make the motion that we increase the threshold from three council members to four, which is basically one third. And if something is important, if it is a special appropriation, then it should garner far more support than that. Um, and I think these guardrails are for our benefit as we are the keepers of the purse. Okay, we got a motion on the floor to extend a minimum of three council members to four for a special appropriation introduction. And we have a second from council member Friedson. Let's uh, do discussion here. Uh, Councilmember Rice. So this one's kind of weird in my book. <laughs> um, I, 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 I've, I've never heard of having a minimum uh, number of members to introduce anything, whether it's an appropriation or a bill. I mean, why, why stop with special appropriations? I mean, bills have fiscal consequences too. I mean, if, and I do understand that you're looking at a quicker, I guess, turnaround. And um, But, I mean, they all have budgetary implications. I mean, I just passed a bill dealing with um, cameras, uh, the, the uh, private security camera bill. That has huge uh, you know, implications. And so it's not a special appropriation, but it's a bill that has money attached to it um, that the county executive needs to find. And I was able to introduce that on my own. Well, Councilman Burkett's support. <laughs> Appreciate that, sir. But I mean, it's like, I, I, just, I just don't get it because you're still voting on it. So, I mean, nothing's going to pass unless you have the support of your council members. So I'm not sure, maybe Council Vice President Glass, you can just help me to understand how that's different between introduction and passage uh, that you think it's going to be any different in terms of outcome. So I appreciate the dialogue. Uh, as, as memory serves, there is not a special appropriation that has been turned down because it is extremely hard to vote against something that seems very important in that moment. But I think as we expand the body and face uncharted budgetary, uh, an uncharted budgetary future, there should be some parameters. And there should be more consensus 
on how we spend taxpayer dollars outside of the normal budget process. We have a normal budget process. We have a reconciliation process. It's a very robust one, and I think it works well. And so anything outside of that process should be given a little more scrutiny. So it's interesting because, it again, all of this is starting to harken back headaches of dealing with Annapolis. As I remember my introduction of bills uh, and the uh, restrictions that uh, if you introduced a bill that had a certain amount of money attached to it, it was basically dead in the water, and that was always the notion uh, of what happened. So your fiscal note uh, was always either the killer or grantor of your bill getting passage. Um, it's not good for the community. It's not good for uh, the legislative process. Um, things should be analyzed based on what, whether it's good for the community or not, and the body should make those decisions, period. Um, that's just my stance there. I mean, this is a philosophical one to where I actually really wasn't uh, concerned about those other ones, but this is a philosophical one that changes the dynamic of the council in terms of what the intentions are. You're actually reducing, and I think that our voters uh, would be concerned about their individual council member's voice being muted uh, by the fact that now their council members can't speak to something that's important to them and can't bring it about unless they have some other person you're still having people that vote on it. So it's not even as though what we want to do is make sure that it's brought to the light and attention of the community as a whole so that folks can weigh in and decide whether or not this is something important. You're actually muting that process that doesn't allow for individuals to bring about issues that could be important. If I have a gang issue in downtown Silver Spring and I want to have a special appropriation to the police department to make sure that we can respond, what you're saying is if nobody else believes that it's important to the people of Silver Spring, sorry, can't even introduce it to have it brought up. That's not good. That's not good government. So I, I, I just caution you there. This is a bad, bad amendment. Thank you, Councilmember Rice. I've got Councilmember Navarro followed by Councilmember Juando. Yeah, I just, I'd like to chime in in the sense that, you know, pre-pandemic, uh, pre special appropriations were very, very rare. Yeah. I mean, it was literally, you know, the council understood that we had a budget process, special appropriations were really like emergency, supplemental um, requests were also very rare. Yes, during the pandemic, we had to, of course, respond because it was a matter of emergency. Um, and so I, I would agree with council member Rice in that sense that, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I think that beginning to put into place particular restrictions like these I don't I don't think that goes with, you know, sort of the history of how the council has done its work. Um, and also, I mean, we have a committee structure, then it has to come to the council. I mean, there are these threshold moments where people have to vote. Um, and, and and I just I feel like that is the process for vetting whatever might happen. But but to require that there would be three or four um, no sponsors to me, to me, that that is a, a big departure. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I again, it's not going to affect me, but I, I would be concerned about the incoming council members to start establishing those types of restrictions um, when we have a robust committee system, and of course, then folks will have to vote. Um, and 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 I think if if you know, coming in, I think during retreats, if there is a presentation of sorts that kind of talks about how the council has conducted its work and why the budgetary process is important. You know, barring an emergency, the special appropriations, of course, are to be few and you know, far in between. I, I think that overall, folks would understand that. Um, so, I mean, I, I I would be concerned about establishing those types of thresholds. Um, seems like it restricts the ability of elected officials to do legislators to do their work. Uh, Councilmember Juando, and then I'm going to chime in too here. Appreciate it. Yeah, I would. You know, I was going to let this slide. I. The way it was, I don't. I didn't like it when we talked about it in the session. We came to what I thought at the time was a uh, compromise when we had our organizational retreat. Um, there, to Councilmember Rice's point, you know, we're elected. It's hard to get elected. <laughs> we got to take. We got to do hard work. We have to take hard votes. The, the idea that it's hard being, to vote against something because you don't think it's fiscally prudent. That's what we're here to do. Uh, so, so I, I, I just. It fundamentally changes the nature of an elected council member, particularly the minority, uh, to be able to speak to a need that someone else 
doesn't see or community that hasn't been represented, you, the way this is written, you already have to have three people to even introduce it, to even discuss it. I, I think that, you know, that's antithetical to the legislative process. If you can't take hard votes, we shouldn't be here. I mean, you know, so I, I, I think to go to four, absolutely not. I don't think we should have it at all. I think any council member should be able to introduce something. Uh, and if it doesn't have support, it doesn't have support. They should be able to articulate it. And if it doesn't have support, it doesn't have support. If through the normal budget process, if you want to introduce something, you, we write letters to each other, we have our committee sessions, you still have to get two or three people to agree to move it forward to get on the reconciliation list. And then it still might not make it. You have to convince now five, soon to be six people to get that off. So it's not easy to pass a budget item anytime. So I, I, I think uh, this is, I don't think it's a good idea to do it at all. I was gonna let it slide, but since it came up, I, I, I just think absolutely can't support this. And I think it's actually reducing the authority and the representation of communities that might want something to be put forward. Um, you know, we have to do make take hard votes all the time. I think we should just say we have to do that and, and, and have the discussion. And I appreciate Councilmember Navarro's point that um, though we haven't had an analysis that these are particularly, these have been rare pre-COVID. Um, you know, I think that, again, what are we trying to solve? You know, in COVID, we did a lot of things together because we had to, we had to respond. But, I, you know, I don't, I don't know what's changed that now we think there's going to be some run on special appropriations. And if so, the council will decide whether they want to do them or not. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Friedson, and then I'll chime in. Yeah, I appreciate what everybody's saying, and I, I think at a, at a high level, I, I agree. Uh, however, uh, there is a structural imbalance right now that exists where it is far harder to get an appropriation through the budget process, through the standard chartered dictated process for our operating budget than it is to get a special appropriation through which is supposed to be extraordinary. It is supposed to be above and beyond. And I understand what everybody is saying, and I agree that every individual legislator needs to be held accountable to the own, the, their own record and their own vote. And every vote we take should balance the needs in the community with the fiscal realities that we face and uh, the competing choices that we have to make. But the fact remains that we have gotten into a scenario where we have become very comfortable with the idea of spending tens of millions of dollars outside of the budget process. And it is not clear to me, unless we put up some guardrails, how we are going to get out of that behavior and how we can ensure that we are being prudent and having fidelity with the fiscal plan that we have and with the responsibility uh, that we have to be stewards. And, and, and the reality is every time we pass a special appropriation, we're spending the reserves that we have made a policy decision weeks before, months before to keep because we think it's important. And so uh, it, it, we, are, we are making a decision which is supposed to be reserved exclusively for emergencies in order to violate a policy that we have agreed to, to have a certain level of reserves. That, that is what a special appropriation, a supplemental appropriation does. It's a vote to violate the established fiscal policy that we have set in order to meet the needs of an emergency. And we have started to do this in areas that aren't about responding exclusively to the public health crisis. And so, I, I'm not saying that this is necessarily the perfect solution to that issue, but if it's not this, it's got to be something because uh, we do need to have the, the guardrails. And, 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 and as the comments were made earlier, I'll just note there are a lot of times where special appropriations do not go to committees, are not discussed in the context of the fiscal plan and the fiscal policy. So if we're not going to do this, I had suggested previously that there be a requirement of a joint jurisdiction and a process where the government operations and fiscal policy jointly reviews a special appropriation with 
the Committee of Jurisdiction. And so I'll just note, you know, I'm going to support this because I think we need to do something. And I think that this would help us to uh, be responsible and to recalibrate the balance that should be expected where it should be harder to approve a special appropriation, which is what the charter intends, than it is to approve uh, funding through the regular standard budget process. Uh, but uh, if we don't do this, I will just note that I think we need to contemplate a significant process that puts up guardrails to ensure that we are not only setting a fiscal plan, but we're actually following through on that fiscal plan and that we are not getting comfortable with what has been an unprecedented moment doing unprecedented actions and making them somewhat normalized, uh, which has very dangerous and significant fiscal consequences. Thanks. Uh, let me just chime in. So in um, 10 of the last 14 fiscal years, there have been budget reductions, right? We've been starting from a deficiency standpoint. And so um, that's the primary. It, it's been fortunate for all of us, especially us newbies on the council. In three of the last four years, we've had essentially surpluses that we've had to work with. And our colleagues that have the scars from previous council session, you know, previous councils had the opposite problem, right? They had to decide what to reduce. Um, and I was often <laughs> on the receiving ends of those reductions. Um, and so it was, uh, you know, sort of a, a tough situation all the way around. Um, and the pandemic did change the game, as has been noted. We were all rushing to put out billion, you know, just so many fires uh, and, and so many issues. Um, and but but because of that, and because we've had these surpluses with the best of intentions, uh, we have moved, I think, uh, an unusually large number of special appropriations. And I'm guilty as charged. I, I've moved a couple. Um, but I think that we do need to reel this in uh, and buy us some time before we may be able to find a better structure in place as the one that uh, Councilmember Friedson and sounds like Councilmember Juando in principle agreed with. But I think we need something in the meantime um, to help ensure that we have a smooth transition fiscally to the next council. And again, the, the next council can change all of this within 90 days, uh, and they probably will. Um, but at least it gives us a starting point from which to have a conversation. I was comfortable with three, but I'm fine with four as well, um, just in the spirit of wanting to um, create those, those uh, checks and balances uh, going, into, going into the next council. So uh, we uh, Council Member Raymer. I'm gonna support the motion. I, I do think you need a higher bar, I do. And it doesn't mean you can't do it, it just means you have to work a little bit harder and get a little bit more support before you try. So I, I think that is a reasonable way to interpret the fiscal policy, which is that it's supposed to be extraordinary. Um, but you can still do it. You just need to get some support uh, in order to proceed. So mm -hmm. thanks. Okay. Councilman Juwando. So, so make a point. You need six members, five or six. To, to, that's the bar. <laughs> you know, the, you're, you're stopping debate before it can even happen. I just, I just have to emphasize that. We're not talking about you introduce it and the money's gone. You're talking about not even being able to introduce it, not even being able to talk about it. I, I just think that that's the problem here. Mm -hmm. you know. I, Vice President, I, I appreciate the way Councilmember Raymer just phrased it. It is a special appropriation, and there should be special rules on how we proceed with those. Can I make a suggestion? Sure. Why don't we require supermajority to pass them? That's where you do the special rules. No, no, you don't want that because you don't want to talk about it. I mean, that's the issue. If, if you were worried about passing them, it would say make a special appropriation require two thirds of the body. I would support that amendment. They are extraordinary. Outside but, of COVID, I'm not sure I've introduced any special appropriations. No, I, just want to no, prepare no, the I just want to prepare the next council with the no, guardrails so that the taxpayer dollars are used and that our special ability. Okay. All right. I, I just, just if, wait, just one okay. at a time. Right. One at a time. All right. One I'm just saying, yeah, I was just saying the guard rail. Member Juwando has the floor. Thank and you. Council and Vice President quick. Glass has a counterpoint that he'd like to make. The guardrail is passage. And then Council Member Wright. I just want to be very clear. The guardrail is passage. Uh, are you trying to get in, Council staff? 
I'm sorry, I, I tuned out a little bit, but I want to make sure I'm clear. The question is on. <laughs> yeah, good, 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 good observation. <laughs> the charter will require seven council members for passage. Right. But already, for, right. There's already, already a supermajority for a special appropriation. Thank yes. you. Yeah. But I, my point was being if you wanted to make it more, because you want to make it super, super majority to pass it. You know, make it make it an awesome majority to Council Reeves. Let's make it eight point eight. But I mean, the idea that you can't even bring it up without getting four members of the council to say you can bring it up, I just think is a is a, slip, a, a bad, bad, bad policy. Okay, and I apologize for not chiming in earlier. Council Vice President Glass, did you have another point that you wanted to make? No. Okay, Council Member Rice. Yeah, I just wanted to say that. Look. Um, <laughs> There, there, there are some things that are here regarding, um, especially as chairs. Uh, so for those who aren't chairs, I certainly understand why you might not understand this. But um, coming into presenting some of these items that are there, whether it's arts and humanities, whether it's our school system, that had things that we had to immediately respond to, of course, we are going to do those things that are necessary with special appropriations. And so from that standpoint, just the statement around not introducing special appropriations, somehow being somehow gifted or special, or that you're adhering to rules that are different from every other council member, actually it's the other way around. We're actually responding to the community for all the things that they need and demand for the immediate and special time Hence the words special appropriation that are important. And then you have to be special enough to make sure that your colleagues understand how special it is and that the community understands how special it is for you to get it through. So all those people who have actually passed special appropriations are pretty damn special. All right. Uh, so we've got a motion and a second on the floor uh, to expand. What is, what is the, motion? the motion is to expand the minimum number of council members to to uh, support the introduction of a special appropriation from three to four. It's three in the in the language right now and Council Vice President Glass is proposing four. Um, does that make sense? Okay. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your hands. So that is Council Member Friedson, Vice President Glass, myself, Council Member Reamer, all those opposed. That is Councilmember Jawando, Councilmember Katz, Councilmember Grice, and uh, Councilmember Navarro. So that is a tie. So it fails. Yep. Yep. Okay, but the policy, the, 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 so the, the, the three. Um, do we support the three? Okay. Uh, then you got to make a motion to vote against it or not support it. Okay. I okay. Do okay. Got it. Got it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's probably that's better. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, it's, uh, Cal okay. So we've got a motion and a second to support the resolution as written uh, for a minimum of three. Uh, we've got Council Member Reamer who'd like to speak to the motion. I just want to make one more point. I served. I joined the council in 2010. I don't think I ever introduced a special appropriation. History could put me wrong, but until 2020. So I went 10 years without doing a special appropriation. Uh, that's the way it's supposed to be. And I am concerned that that's not the way it's going to be in the future. So I do think we need some roles. So, yes. Got it. Um, Council Member Joinder. I just, just want to state, since this is different, I'm, I'm not going to vote for this uh, because of stated previous reasons. I think that's a good point. I've never introduced a special appropriation other than ones that we've all done on like food security. Uh, so, uh, I don't think that uh, there's a problem we're trying to solve here. And again, so thank you. All right. Uh, we have a motion to accept as written a minimum of three council members and a second. All those in favor of the language as it's written in the document, please raise your hands. That is Council Member Katz, Council Member Reamer, myself, Council Vice President Glass, and Council Member Friedson. So that motion does carry. Just and those opposed? <laughs> Uh, Council Member Rice, Council Member Jawando, and Council Member Navarro. Okay. Uh, anything else, Ms. McCartney? One Green? last thing just to wrap up, Council President. Uh, Council staff has an amendment to the proposed resolution that's in the packet in regards to the effective date of the resolution. And so typically, according to Rule 7, a resolution would take effect on adoption. The recommendation here is um, to specify a different date. December 5th, 2022 is when this resolution should become effective. 
uh, without objection. Are we okay with that? December 5th? No issue? No issue. All right. Great. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, is that it, Ms. McCartney Green? Yeah, but we should go ahead and take a. Is it a hand vote or? It's a hand vote. vote. Christine is about to confirm. Yes. As amended. Yeah. Well, let's give it a second. Christine's looking at the little blue book. Ms. Wallens, I believe it's a roll call vote. That was a joke. What a good sense of humor. Roll call not explicitly required, but optional. All right, roll call it is. Uh, can I get a motion to move the, okay, and a second? All right, moved by Councilmember Katz, seconded by Councilmember Friedson. Let's go to the roll call vote. Mr. Katz. Yes. Mr. Katz votes yes. Mr. Juwando. Yes. Mr. Juwando votes yes. Mr. Reamer. Yes. Mr. Reamer votes yes. Mr. Hucker is absent. Ms. Navarro. Yes. Ms. Navarro votes yes. Mr. Rice. Yes. Mr. Rice votes yes. Mr. Friedson. Yes. Mr. Friedson votes yes. Mr. Glass. Yes. Mr. Glass votes yes. Mr. Albernose. Yes. Mr. Albernose votes yes. All right. Let the record show that that passes unanimously as amended among all those present and virtual. Um, just quick news and note here, colleagues, uh, before um, adjourning to a closed session. The first is, is I want to put a plug in. Uh, we have our Youth Town Hall on Wednesday night. Um, and so this is an annual event, an important one to all of us. We have hundreds of students that have signed up uh, to participate. I know many of us are on the record saying it's our favorite town hall. Uh, so we, we look forward to that this Wednesday evening, tomorrow night. Um, and so now I need a motion to go into closed session to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice pursuant to Maryland Code General Provisions Article 3305B1I. Topic is a personnel matter concerning one or more specific appointees, employees, or officials. Moved by Councilmember Juwando, seconded by Councilmember Rice. All those in favor, please raise your hands. And that is unanimous among all those present and virtual. So with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>